I'm making this announcement in compliance with the Open Public Meeting Act being Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, Laws of the State of New Jersey. The Planning Board Secretary has prepared a schedule of the meetings of the Planning Board of the Borough of Kenilworth for the year 2019 and has posted a true copy of this schedule on the bulletin board located at the front entrance of Borough Hall and has mailed true copies of this schedule to the local source and Star Ledger and is maintaining a copy of this schedule in Borough Hall. Accordingly, accordingly, this notice requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act have been satisfied in regards to this meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Paserno? Here. Mr. David? <coughs> Oh, who's that? Mr. Gmaldi? Here. Mr. Pantina? Here. Mr. Damasio? Here. Mr. Lodowdy? Here. Mr. Scuderi? Here. Mr. Scuderi? Here. Mr. Zach? Zach? Here. Any communications, Kathy? None, Chairman. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move on to resolutions, which we also have none. So we're going to go right into some old business. Application 6-19 and 379. Ventos USA LLC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Patrick McNamara from the law firm of Scrincy Hollenbeck on behalf of the applicant. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank the board for giving us the courtesy to take time, especially on a holiday week, to, to conduct this special meeting to hear this application. Um, Ventos is looking to come in. They're an international company that's a century old, as you'll hear in a few minutes, um, with an extensive history of operating in the flavor and fragrance ingredient industry. Uh, it's my understanding, in fact, that even another company, uh, Capella, that's in the industry is uh, already established here in Kenilworth on Market Street. But as you'll hear in a few minutes, they're part of a larger industry whose core of over 70 companies here in New Jersey alone, uh, the industry grew up in the tri-state region and has since branched out in the century plus since it started to evolve. Um, we have a number of witnesses we'll hear tonight. Uh, we'll have a representative from our client, uh, Jim Farrell, our architect, Bob McFeathers, who did the uh, design of the fire suppression system, uh, Mike Lanzafama, who I'm sure you know for civil engineering, and our planner, Nick Raviano. Um, And just let me emphasize at the start of this, and you'll hear from several of our witnesses, that there will be a very significant emphasis on making sure that this facility is designed to meet or exceed all applicable building code requirements, fire code requirements, uh, as well as the fact that we recognize that it is one of the more heavily regulated industries in this country, because it's subject to both state, EP, state DEP, federal EPA, Homeland Security, Department of Transportation, uh, Federal Aviation Administration if you're shipping by air. Uh, so it is, a, it is an industry that is well known to governmental entities at the local, county, state, and federal level. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to quick call our first witness, Mr. Ignacio Vallis. Mr. McNamara, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I'm assuming that the original request for an appeal in addition to the use variance is no longer in place. We ask that it be tabled at this time. At this time? Yeah, if we get a favorable result, then it goes away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So are you swearing our partners? Yeah, what we'd like to do is, is swear in our people first and our, um, our uh, professionals. Um, all right. Let me... First, uh, Kevin O'Brien's our planner, Victor Negger's our engineer. Let me swear you two guys in first. If you could raise your right hands with regard to this matter, do you swear any testimony or comment you may make? Show me the truth. I do. Thank I you. Victor Eva Negra, planner. Very I'm good. Sorry, engineer. Thank you. Trying to move it over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McNamara, we also have three, I would say, consultants. Um, Mr. Alfano is our fire subcode official. If you could stand up, I know we have Mr. Pringle. David Pringle. David Pringle. Pringle, if you could stand up. And we have one other consultant. Bob Shagan. Yeah, these are in the fire fire area, safety fire area. Side. They're just consult they want to hear. You know, so they can they can help us understand. If you gentlemen could raise your right hands with regard to this application, do you swear that uh, any comments and testimony you may make show you the truth? I do. Thank you. 
Um, they may not say anything. They may they may uh, ask a question or two. We don't know. But so no, that's fine. Start. We're prepared to answer to the best of our collective ability any question that the board has or its professionals. Very good. And for the record, um, I just want to let it be known that I did provide um, I did provide Mr. McNamara with a copy of the bio for Mr. Uh, Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I serve you to raise your right hand. With regard to this matter, do you swear the testimony you may give shall be the truth? Yes. Sir. Could you state your name and spell your last name, please? Ignacio Valles. Why don't you spell your first name as well? Uh, I G M A C I O. I G M A I G N A C I O. Ignacio, okay. And your last Ignacio. name? And the last name is Valles, V A L L E S. V A. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I'd like to ask everyone to please speak up nice and clearly for the microphone and make sure all their phones are shut off so we can hear everything. We have audio and video. Thank you. All right. I've been handed a, uh, a packet entitled Ventos. I'm going to mark this. We're, uh, we're a little more low tech. We don't have PowerPoint. We have the next best That's thing, paper and ink. Fine with nice. I'm going to mark this A1 in evidence. Uh, A1 and what can we call this, Mr. McNamara? Uh, for shorthand, PowerPoint okay. presentation, history of Ventos operations. Okay. Mr. Vallis, if you could please provide the board with the benefit of your background and experience uh, working with Ventos and in the flavor and fragrance industry. Yeah, uh, so my background is a uh, university degree in economics. I studied in Barcelona in a university called uh, Pompeu Fabra. And I've been, oh, sorry. <clears throat> I studied economics in Barcelona, a degree in the university. And I have been in Ventos working for seven years in different positions and different markets, always related to in, in the sales. What's your current your current position? Just and my current position is a senior sales manager in Barcelona, and I have been appointed to be the general manager for Ventos USA. Thank you. If you walk through what we've already marked as Exhibit A1 to provide the board and the public with a little bit of a background of the history of the operations and the history of the company itself. So, uh, Ventos is a distribution company specialized in the flavor and the fragrance industry. Um, our headquarters are based in Spain, in Barcelona, and we have two small uh, production units in Spain and in France, but that's just a small part of our business. And here in the US, the only thing we're gonna do is pure distribution, nothing of production. Uh, the materials that we distribute are aroma chemicals and essential oils, and, uh, and the aim of this uh, company right now is to become a global player. We have uh, over 100 years of history, as you can see in the third page of the document. It was founded in 1916, and nowadays we already trade more than 2,600 products. That's the total number, especially stored in Spain. We have over 240 employees, and uh, we are already present in seven countries in the world, in Brazil, China, Mexico, France, Singapore, Colombia, and now in, in the United States. So if you move on uh, to the uh, next page, you will see the uh, world and our presence there. So uh, this step of coming into the States is kind of our last step in our expansion strategy. Uh, the United States is one of the biggest markets in the flavor and fragrance industry. New Jersey is the leading market in, in the States uh, where all the perfumery houses are based. And uh, there's also a second hub in Chicago, mainly for the flavor production. Uh, so as I said, um, the, we have more 244 employees right now. In the next page, mm -hmm. you will see one uh, marketing 
uh, paper that we did once with the noses of the team. That's uh, a very important part of uh, what I will present as the next general manager. Uh, these 244 people are the people that make Ventos move and have been able to make Ventos grow until where we are now. Um, here with me it's uh, Carlos, it's our operations, global operations director. He has been involved in the creation and the well function of our subsidiaries in Brazil, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Singapore and other parts of the world. We also have eight people in the regulatory affairs departments. They make sure that we comply all the regulations in Spain and everywhere around the world. Sometimes we have to adapt the documents that we give to the customers depending on the regulations of each country. Uh, we also have 14 people in our laboratory in Spain and we have a few more technical people in each subsidiary. We have 15 people in the IT department and I could uh, continue like this. So it's not only uh, me or Matthew or a few people that are coming, it's a large corporation that I represent, but uh, we bring a hundred years of experience and all these people that, that come with us around, along the the project. I mean, I prepared a list which I've marked as Exhibit A too. This is a list of over 70 companies that in some way or form are engaged in commerce with the flavor and fragrance industry, correct? That's correct, yeah. And these are all companies based here in New Jersey? All these companies are based in New Jersey and are the companies that we know. We have been 12 years working in the U.S. market uh, and now we want to make this step and during these 12 years We've met with uh, or done business with these companies in New Jersey. There are more, much more around the country. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions about the operations you envision happening here at the facility on Boatwright. Um, this would be primarily a 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. weekday type operation? Yeah. You don't envision it being a nice weekend, round the clock type no. of operation? And approximately how many employees would you have there? Our idea is to grow the team until six or seven people have two or three in the warehouse and three or four more in the offices. And you'd be receiving deliveries by truck once or twice a week on average? Uh, yes, more or less. And then right. packages come in quite often in a 55-gallon drum and then are broken down into smaller containers for transport out to be sold to your customers? Correct. Depending on the needs of the customer, we would repack into a smaller container. Okay. Uh, besides those tr uh, truck deliveries, would you be getting the typical type of delivery from like a FedEx truck, a UPS truck, a couple of days a week? In some cases, when something has to be shipped from Spain in an origin, like fast shipment, yes. Okay. And it's your understanding that there will be a sophisticated uh, air handling system put into the facility to make sure that there are no odors or anything leaving the building, right? Absolutely, yes. And when something is taken out of a drum and put into a smaller package, it's done in a designated repack area or white room, as it might be known, where it has separate ventilation and is sealed off from the rest of the building. Yes. And once you're done with the container, uh, and you wait for it to be picked up, it's stored strictly inside and not outside the premises? Yes, always. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to further, witness, uh, further questions to this particular witness at this time to reserve the right to recall as necessary. I have a couple questions. Uh, can I call you Ignatio? Yeah. You said that your operations are from 7 to 5. That's your sales operations. Am I correct? Or is that sales and manufacturing? And will manufacturing go through the night? Sales and warehouse, there's no manufacturing. No manufacturing at all. There is no manufacturing at all. And I say seven to five because at seven, the warehouse employees would start and the salespeople would come <coughs> in more so around nine. When you get your 55 gallon drums and you break them down into the smaller containers, that's not considered manufacturing? Oh, well, I mean that we don't blend any You don't blend it, you no. just redistribute from a large container to a small. Yes, and when it is needed, it's not always done. I would say that 70%, and that's just on the top of my head, of our operations is just get one drum from China or whatever it has come and sell it to a customer <laughs> without uh, manipulating the material. And in some cases for a smaller 
uh, customers, they need to buy smaller quantities, and that's one. Yeah. And I think Mr. McNamara asked a question about um, trucks that come in at uh, FedEx or what have you. Are you having any straight jobs coming in with, uh, not straight jobs, 53 foot trailers coming in to bring those 55 gallon drums in? Uh, or 18 yes. wheelers? 18 wheelers, yeah. Exactly. How, how often would that be? Uh, that really depends on how well we do our job, but uh, I would expect at least... It looks uh, like you're doing pretty well, so what do you figure um, that you may have in the estimate, if I may? Uh, two per week. Two per week? Yeah. Okay. Two per week in our high season, I'd say. <coughs> I'm going to mark something as Exhibit A3, but I have to ask that it comes back. Um, How do I like it? <laughs> well, uh, um, Ignacio, if you could please describe what uh, this can, this display case. This display case is what we use when we go to see customers. <coughs> we bring them samples of the materials that we want to sell. I brought some different kind of materials. The majority of them are uh, natural essential oils. And uh, I just thought that it could be a good idea for you to realize what do we sell and what, how they smell. Ignatia, I want you to understand that if this was Shark Tank, we'd all get a package. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then you would have to invest money. I'm not sure how the local government ethics act would treat either one of those who are doing that. So when we have a grand opening, we'll invite it. Thank you. So while they're passing down the fragrance, uh, the oils, uh, my other questions still go to trucking and things like that. Did, um, and you may listen in on this too, Kevin. Did we talk about uh, times of days uh, when the trucking should be and could be coming in and out and how that's going to be approached so it doesn't um, affect our flow of traffic in the early morning hours. We, we'll talk more about that. Oh, we can ask the question right now. So do you know that? So what we have here... To direct your truck deliveries so that they only come at a certain time in the morning so they're not interfering with other traffic during the rest of the day. Would that be doable? I think so, yes. Okay. I, I am not an expert on logistics in the U.S., but I think it's something that okay. we do in Spain that we can show. We do have a very uh, big problem with trucking coming in and out at certain hours, especially with the schoolings close by, Route 22, our gateway. And so what that would do is impact uh, all that traffic coming in and out. So we need to talk more about how we would get your vehicles in and out and what the exit route will be as well as the entry. I mean, for the route that our trucks would have to follow, that's something that for sure we can do according to the needs of the town. And the timings when they come in and they go out, I think that it's also something that we can work out. Especially the shipments that we send out of our warehouse, that's not going to be on very large uh, trucks. Because normally we resell in a smaller quantities, not full trucks. And my next question really goes more to you, Michelle. You here, you're here from Barcelona, I guess. Yeah, or Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and 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 you're here for the duration, or you're here for the startup? I'm here for the startup and the next five years. Okay. And for the next five years. Yes. So welcome to Kenilworth. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. You may go. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's anything else in the PowerPoint that we want to go over. It gives sure. you some we may details. Have another question, Mr. Back um, it shows you the typical type of warehouse production facilities, which are not here. There is no production facility at this proposed operation. Mr. McNamara, can I please just ask one or two more yeah. questions of, of the witness? <laughs> All right. If I could sum up what I heard, just so we have a starting point. You, you, this is going to be a warehouse. Yeah. Shipments will come in by one way or the other, and then they are distributed to your clients, to your customers. Uh, there's no mixing, there's no ma manufacturing, there's no uh, uh, chemists working in this facility. No. You're going to have racks, I'm assuming, in, mm -hmm. in, like similar to, to what you showed in A1. Yeah. Is there any retail? Can people walk in here and buy something? No. No. So it's strictly, it comes in, stored, and goes out. Correct. 
And the only moment the product leaves the original drum is when we repack it in that special room and we transfer it. Oh, you to have the a model. special room. You will have a special room here if it's approved for for Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. A special well, room with the another. Next room, this will describe where the repack room is located. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So I, I'm, because he talked about the drums and things like that, it just brings up another question. Maybe your other witness can handle that too. You are going to have um, empty containers, the drums. Yeah. What happens to those? Are they recycled? Do they go back to be refilled? Do you get rid of them? The, there's uh, the company that sells us the drums. They also collect the used ones because they do recycle the drums. So the contents that's in the drum when it gets there, whatever they are, oils, perfume, or whatever, mm -hmm. does that have a washing system before it goes out? Or no. is that? No, we don't do that. You don't do that? We so just... anything that's in that container is going to stay in that container Correct, yeah. And so, if this is approved, and if it's good enough to put on your body, then it's good enough to go into the landfill. Like, oh, I don't know. Well, let's, well, let's not go into the landfill. Well, the metal? Right, they recycle the drums. Well, they're reusing. Yeah, they're, they're reusing drums. drums. If that's where it ends up, that's why I asked the question. There's so, a, is there a service you have that comes once or twice a month to pick up the empty five gallon, thousand, fifty five gallon drums? Yeah. And it's their responsibility to recycle or reuse those drums, but it's now their responsibility, not yours. Yeah, correct. So, question. So, that's, that's uh, just excuse yeah. me, that's just a little open ended for me. Even though it's their responsibility, because yes, the other the facility that's taking the drum away. But if there's something in that drum that's hazardous or harmful, he can't just send it out and say, "Well, now it's your responsibility." Uh, You're un under RICRA, if it's non-hazardous, then it goes out as such and has to be manifested. If it was being disposed of as a waste item, you'd have to manifest it differently than as opposed to. A recycling operation which has to catalog what types of containers is taking back in then it's up to them to have a facility that either does a specialized rinse or wash or other material uh, to try to reutilize the container sometimes it can't be depending on the nature of the substance that's really usually not the case with this type of industry mm -hmm. you find that more with solvents industrial cleaners things of that nature certain types of containers can't be reused just because of the nature of what was in them so then they recycle the container instead I understand. I, the reason I ask, I'm in the urethane business, so I understand what has to be done with containers and with packaging upon completion. So, thank you. Question. So, the reason for the special room is to, not to blend, is to transfer repack. the, to repack, right, but, but in the repacking we need a special room, right, so we don't leak out anything or anything. So, to support Mr. Uh, our Chairman's question, um, when you're done and the empty container is sitting there, is the room large enough to keep all the refuge of these empty containers in the room, or is some light body going to be handling them and sticking them out in the yard, sticking them out on the side, and um, until the vendor who's coming to take those cans away? Where are those cans going to be stored? How are they going to be stored? And any is any of the contents from the original uh, vessels going to, in any way, uh, can it be spilled outside onto uh, the parking lot? I guess when you get I into the ground. I previously testified any empty containers are strictly stored inside the building and never outside. Correct. And you would set up a designated rack area to place the empty 55 gallon drums or five or 10 gallon pails to be stored until the service comes to reclaim them and take them from the building. Correct. And at no point in time uh, is any activity done to empty anything out of a drum or a five gallon pail or 10 gallon pail other than in the repack room only in the facility. Yeah, that's correct. And we have a witness later who'll describe the fire suppression system and all the other items that are uh, being designed for the facility to address any other concern you have, sir, that you've articulated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions before you say something? Yeah, Paul at the end. He's, he's, gonna, he's got plenty of witnesses. To make. Did you want to, did they want to ask? Um, you want to hold your questions or? Oh, okay. Good guess. Mr. Farrar? 
Sir, could you raise your right hand, please? Yes, sir. With regard to this application, do you swear the testimony you're about to give somebody the truth? Yes, sir. Could you state your name and spare your last name, please? James Farrell. F like Frank, A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. Mr. Farrell, for the benefit of the board and public, please provide us with the benefit of your educational background and current license <coughs> in both in New Jersey and elsewhere. I'm a classically trained, licensed architect. Yes, Oh. Face you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm a uh, classically trained licensed architect. I'm licensed in the state of New Jersey and 13 other states, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, um, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Utah, California. I think that's it. Have you so, ever been before us here? I've never been before you in Canada. No, sir. Okay. You've been accepted as an expert in other land use boards in the state of New Jersey. Yes, I have. And I'd offer him as an expert in his field of expertise. Sounds good to me. Mr. Farrell, if you could please describe for the benefit of the board uh, the type of facility that's being designed for Ventos and your role in effectuating that design. So my firm has designed this facility. It is a 20,000 square foot uh, facility for the storage of combustible materials. There is a small repack room where we will take larger drums, maybe 55 gallon drums, and pack them into five gallon pails. That'll happen in one room. Why don't we mark mark this? I don't think we have that color yeah, on so us. That should be A4. 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 And that can be described as a colorized floor plan. Floor plan. This is a colorized floor plan of the existing building. Uh, we can see that the, the color represents the two different uses of the building. Uh, the green area is um, the tenant, the other tenant of the building, and the purple area is Ventos's area. It's a total of 20,055 square feet, give or take. So you can see this is our section. Okay, we have some offices in the front, right corner in the southwest, and then this is the small repack room that you've heard testimony about before. So the facility is warehouse storage of only combustible materials. So uh, it's very important that we understand that these are combustible not flammables, uh, and there's a, a big difference between those two. It has to do with the volatility of the material. That'll be stored in the warehouse portion. As part of Ventos's business, they will repack. So if a material comes in a 55 gallon drum and the client only wants 10 gallons, it gets repacked into a 10 gallon drum. Okay, and that will happen in the repack room in the northeast plan corner. Uh, and that's a room separated from the rest of the space. It has its own HVAC system, it has special exhaust. The entire facility is designed with containment and control to make sure that no spills get outside. Um, I know that, I'm not sure when the sales will testify. Right after you. Right after me, but you'll see that there is the addition of a, uh, a containment tank that's being put in outside. That's to make sure that anything that's spilled inside the building doesn't escape outside, is contained. Uh, so that's the, the primary function of the building. And the other tenant is the uh, Emirates Airlines, and that's where they do their pre-packaged uh, meals for their airline guests. Yes, and I understand. the uh, wall separating the two is solid, so that there's no interconnection, no doorways, uh, no ventilation between the two spaces. There is. You can see that there's a red dash line that represents a two-hour fire-rated wall separating the existing occupancy of Emirates and Ventus' new proposed occupancy. Mm -hmm. And by code, that, that's above and beyond. The that line. is above and beyond, actually. So uh, according to the building code, the separation between an H3 occupancy and an F1 occupancy needs a one-hour fire rated wall. We put a two-hour wall um, as our design standard because when we're separating occupancies between tenants, if this was all Ventos' building and I was separating a non-combustible use, it would be a one-hour wall. But because we're separating two tenants, we want to provide that extra layer of protection. So we put a two-hour fire rating wall between them. It just gives us peace of mind. You can explain which one and F1, we don't all know that. Sure, okay, so um, according to the building code, so in New Jersey, right now this project is being designed under the 2015 International Building Code. And the building code, uh, according to chapter three, breaks down uh, buildings into different types of occupancies. And the various occupancies are A for assembly, B for business, I for institutional and for mercantile, and then there's F1 and F2, which is factory. So F1 is modernizer, 
uh, factory, which is what this building is currently divided at. Um, it's for most occupancies. And then there is an H occupancy. The H occupancy is hazardous occupancy. And you become a hazardous occupancy when you exceed the exempt amount of combustible and flammable liquids in your space. So we have combustibles in here, and I, I told you that earlier there is um, a big difference between flammables and combustibles. So flammables are broken into 1A, 1B, and 1C flammables, and it has to do with the flash point and the boiling point of the material and how volatile it is. So a lower boiling point and a lower flash point means that the material will be more readily ignited. Okay, and as you go up, uh, there's combustibles, two, class two, class three A, and class three B combustibles. And that has to do with the flash point. Once you go into combustibles, it's just a flash point. So a class two is a flash point between 100 degrees and 140 degrees. 140 to 200 and above 200 is three B. It's important to know that in a fully sprinkled building, class three B combustibles are not limited. So if there were only class 3B combustibles, I could have 10,000 drums of them in here and it would be completely legal with no change. And it would be in an F1 occupancy or an S1 occupancy at that point. It would be S1 is storage occupancy. Um, so uh, there's a table in the building code. It's table 307.1. And that is the maximum allowable quantities per area and that's what dictates whether you have to become an H occupancy or not. So because we exceed, um, and for class two in storage, it's uh, 240 gallons, and for class 3A, it's 660 gallons. If you exceed that in your storage, you become an H occupancy. In this case, H3 is what we are because we're only storing um, or using less than the exempt amount, which is 60 gallons for the space. So in the repack room, we will never have more than one 55 gallon drum being dispensed. So this is an H3 occupancy, okay? And what an H3 occupancy means, and, and the same thing is true of all the, the building occupancy groups, whether it's business or uh, you know, mercantile, educational, institutional, there are requirements in the code for how you have to handle that facility. In the next one, we have travel distance, <coughs> allowable building area, required ventilation, <coughs> outside air requirements, and the same is true. H2 just has a different set of requirements for us to be able to safely handle this material. And that's, that's what we designed. Okay. And as an architect, you're familiar with the building design. There's no changes that are being made to the exterior, the parking lot, or anything else to the building, correct? To, no. And in your professional opinion, do you believe all the interior design work that you've described meets all the applicable building and fire code requirements for this type of facility? Yes, I do. Thank you. I have no further questions to the witness at this time. Sure. I do have a, uh, one or two questions. As you knew, I would, right, Mr. I, I figured. <laughs> That's why I get to come to these parties. I, I think I think you've handled the firewall and uh, the uh, demising wall, if you will, eloquently. And I think uh, pertaining to fire and safety on that side of it, it works real good. However, right next door, your neighbor is Emirates, which came before this board, and they're in a food distribution business. Yes, sir. Is there any way, any way at all, of cross contamination or something from the products that are being used? on the Vento side to the opposite side, where there could be a situation, be it, I know you have great fume extraction and what sure. have you, but is there any way that Emirates could suffer any type of loss, or not Emirates, the people could any, suffer some Any type? person or any food that's prepared in there? And my answer would be no. Uh, so uh, there, there's two reasons why I believe this. So the first reason is everything that's in the main storage is sealed, closed, and never opened. So uh, there's, there's no opportunity for, if, there, I mean, if there's a leak, if there's anything, it'll be immediately addressed. But there's no open containers. There's no odors. So in this entire section, there is absolutely 
No possible way. Barring some catastrophic failure, if a meteor hits the building, you know. But but there is another way. If if in fact I, I took a look at this beautiful PowerPoint and it it's really done nice, state of the art. But I also noticed that the, you have the 55 gallon drums on pallets which are on loading racks. Correct. And in order to get them on and off, you're either going to use a forklift, reach machine, or what mm -hmm. have you. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be the first time that a driver picked up that fork and pierced that barrel. Absolutely. So that's what if it's that really going to happen. It would be a single drum, 55 gallons and 20,000 square feet. Uh, one of the requirements, and so we really didn't talk about the ventilation system at all. In the main facility, uh, according to an H3 occupancy uh, from Chapter 7 of the International Mechanical Code, we need one CFM per square foot of 100% outside air in this building. Please, we have to lay people in. Absolutely. Thank you. So, what that means. Okay, in your house right now, you have an air conditioning system, okay? And what it does is it takes the air that's in your house and it brings it to a central unit and it either heats it or cools it to, uh, to make it more comfortable in your house. In a facility like this, we have uh, a different kind of system and it, it, it uses 100% outside air so that instead of it recirculating any air in the space, all of the air that's actually brought in here, heated and, and treated, is from the outside. And then we exhaust 100% of that. So that means we are exhausting 20,000 cubic feet per minute of air, which is, um, I, I wanted to get to this, and I was trying to think of a good way to explain it to you so you can understand. Um, we all have bathrooms, and you have a bathroom fan in your house. The bathroom fan in your house exhausts 110 CFM, cubic feet per minute. That's how much that exhausts. I am exhausting 20,000 CFM from here. So if we had a spill, that air would be, no odor would translate into the other side of the building. There is no way that we would have any, there's no way that there's- So all your makeup air is coming from outside ventilation? Correct. 100% of our makeup air. And then the same thing is true, there's actually a separate system, both supply and return, in the uh, repack room. And that's 600 CFM. Okay, about six of your home bathroom fans. So when we're talking about, you know, the volume, when we're repacking, uh, there's a special fan, it's called the cyclonic fan. So it's a vector fan, and what it does is it actually takes the air with a very powerful fan motor and it, it takes 50% makeup air from outside and then 50% from in the room and it shoots it in a cyclone, kind of like a tornado, up in the air and completely dilutes the air. So the air is diluted. Um, there's no chance for reentrainment. Reentrainment is uh, the concept that uh, if I were to exhaust air from my building that was filled with odors, and it blew down the roof to Emirates, and it got sucked in their units, it would then be spit into their buildings. So we have designed the system so that there is no chance, with the prevailing winds, the cyclonic fan, the air gets blown away from Emirates, it is completely diluted um, within 50 feet uh, the fan air is 0.007% of any airflow that was in the room. There's absolutely no chance that you are bringing odors from Ventos into Emirates or any of your neighbors. So in addition to that question, the air conditioning and heating system is independent and it's not a combined duct system no. and there is no penetration, there's all Everything's completely is enclosed. Yes. Okay. So that is, and that's, I mean, part of that's code and part of that's practice. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Anyone else? I have a question. Um, you talked about these products being combustible as opposed to flammable. Correct. Okay. Putting aside the fragrance, fragrances, what other materials or products that we all commonly use 
that could be stored here would be considered combustible. I'm just and any to, product that you use that's combustible? Yeah, put it in, in, in layman's terms, uh, like uh, gasoline tanks, paper. Okay, so, so gasoline tanks uh, are dramatically worse than this. Okay. So gasoline is a flammable liquid. It has a, a flash point of minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything in here has a flash point of above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so combustibles are... Just some common... Sure. So we can relate it to what Ventus um, wants, right. wants to store. Aftershave, um, any material that has been dilu diluted in, in product. So it will have some predominantly alcohol-based essential oils. So we have lemon oils. All these different oils have some combustibility. Aerosol cans. Aerosol cans are the most dangerous. Um, aerosol cans are in their own category, and they are a hundred times worse. All right, so if, if I it, stored Old Spice aftershave here, that would be combustible. It would, it would be combustible. If he stored Old Spice, he wouldn't be sitting next to <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because Old Spice is at a level below the flammable. All right, I'm just trying to get a sense of... Yes, uh, so there's household cleaners that you're yeah. going to be using. Uh, so I mean, you're, you're going to find a similar component in Home Depot in the finished goods. Now, Ventos makes the ingredients that goes into products that you use all the time. Okay. And I mean, it's, it's things like top, <clears throat> bounce, uh, you know, Windex, everything that has fragrances and all these different they, This is where those fragrances come from. And there's How about paints, house paint? If I stored house paint, gallons of house paint? Gallons of house, uh, uh, house paint, paint is not combustible, <laughs> you don't believe. Um, okay. But, but paint thinner, paint thinner is probably flammable. Yeah, paint thinner is flammable. I think so, we have another question from our one of our experts, Robert. Uh, experts. I keep saying Schagendorf, Schagendorf. 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 I'm sorry. That's it. The information I was given, we gave some safety data sheets. Yes, yes. There's three that showed to me that were flammable. I'm going to give them to you. Maybe you can check. Maybe they were in error. I'm not yep. sure. Sure. But, um, what do you got? And Bob, what, just let the applicant know what you uh, do. The next witness can better answer yeah, that's those that's questions that's than the R. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bob Sagendorf. I am a certified safety professional specializing in industrial safety and health. I have approximately 34 years' experience in that. I'm also a licensed fire official, fire inspector. I've got 41 years on the voluntary fire department. Past president of the American Society of Safety Engineers, chairman of the Industrial Safety and New Jersey State Industrial Safety Committee. So I'm really, I'm a staple of safety within New Jersey. Okay, so I've got a lot of experience. Thank you. And including fire, process safety management, and this operation is, I'm very, very familiar with what's like, let's work with fire management. So. Absolutely. So. Okay, so, so that's one thing you can clarify that because that's going to. We're, we're going to let Rob. Uh, that's fine, because that sounds like that's going to. I've got a lot of my better people. Thank you. What, what did you get? What, no, I think that's just a, a report, basically. These are, these are safety data sheets. Material safety data sheets. So what this does is these are, so and we, one of the things that Ignacio testified about is that they have 2,600 materials. And of the 2,600 materials, these three, there was a question about. And um, one of my colleagues is going to answer the question about. But the these aren't exhibits, Patrick. I mean, these are Not just. yet. They, they okay. should be. All right. Right. They will be. Okay. So those are three. Part of the file? I'm sorry? I think they're part of weren't they submitted? Yes, they, they were, were submitted. Part of the there was a follow up order to your okay. fire commission. They, they're on file. Okay. So those three documents you have there were the ones in question. Now, who questioned that? Our fire official? I believe so. Fire question. You? Yes, gentlemen. Okay. Where did you receive them? They were in my packet of information. Okay. Okay. And the reason I'm saying it because testimony was just dictated that there is, part, there is no flammables in the building. Am I correct? That's yes, that, that is correct. Okay. And, and the safety no data sheets I was provided, I'm not good at math, but I did the conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and I came up with three products that are under 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which would classify that as a, uh, as a flammable liquid. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if these three items are the majority of what's in that building, then then it's going to alter some of the thinking that, and some of the questions I have. Okay. So maybe they were in error, or maybe they were just a sample of what they had provided, but it was in the packet I gave, so I'm assuming that there was due diligence gave and provided about the material and flammable liquids and combustible liquids that are going to be in this establishment. 
That's all. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Mr. McNamara, we're going to need to get that information. We'll, we'll have it for you when I have another witness who will specifically address these particular items. All right. We got to go into order here. I think Mr. Grimaldi was first. You had mentioned that there's going to be no changes to the outside, but then you also had mentioned the civil engineer is going to talk about a containment system on the outside. It's actually uh, just a tank that's buried underground, so there are no changes to, to the, the physical. Outside. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, and. In regards to the safety room. To the repack room, sir? The repack room. Yes, sir. Now, you said there's an exemption that of you're at one classification for as long as there's under 60 gallons. Correct. If it was over 60 gallons, what would the additional requirements be? Um, so the change would then become from an H3 to an H2 occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only difference between the two uh, in the building would be uh, a one-hour wall separating the there, there's no separation between h3 and h2 mm -hmm. but between other occupancies so if, if this was actually contiguous to the other facility we would need the two-hour wall okay so what the same you're taking the exception but really you don't need to take the exception. I don't, there, there is no yeah there's no reason for an exception because we are completely 100 percent meeting the code requirements i just want to clarify yeah. i didn't think you needed it but you stated it so, I got it. So, I mean, we, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, sir. Bob. Bob, Bob just talked about formation. So there's, in New Jersey, uh, one of the things we didn't discuss is my firm. Uh, my firm specializes in the flavor and fragrance industry. Um, as a firm, we've done over 400 projects for the flavor and fragrance industry. In New Jersey, um, the, everyone, the, there was a list of 70 given to you. The top five, uh, all multi-billion dollar companies are all in New Jersey large manufacturing facilities, and we've, we've worked in, in all of their facilities. We've designed literally hundreds of uh, this type of project. So we want to be in an abundance of caution. We're, we're not looking to short circuit any. So there are many of these in New Jersey as we speak. There are many of these in New Jersey as we speak. Okay, I think Ms. Scuderi, Mr. Scuderi has a question. Um, yes. You stated the largest drum you're gonna have is 55 gallons? Correct. Okay, so I mean the PowerPoint shows the 300 gallon toes, but you're not going to have them here. No, so that's only illustrative. Okay. Yeah, not there. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, a standard IBC would be 275 gallons, and they are not stored here. Anyone else have any questions, Mr. Yeah. O'Brien? Thank you, Chairman. Under the uh, Chairman's hypothetical that somebody pierces a 55 gallon drum. The 55 gallon drum is concentrate, I presume. So it's whatever chemical. So there, it's not that there's concentrate or, so in, in other places, this is the raw material. Okay. Yeah. So when that is exhausted, there's going to be a fragrance in the air. Uh, well, you would have to think about the dilution of the space. There should be no fragrance, no noticeable fragrance in the air at that point. If you, have, if you emptied the content of an entire 55 gallon drum, Okay, and then went through the process. There is a, a, a process for cleanup for that, that as part of, of their operating procedure. Uh, at 20,000 cubic feet per minute of air exhaust, the dilution would be such that there's not enough vapor generated from the spill to create an odor outside the building. You would not be able to notice it. If you were there, you would smell it. But on the roof, 36 feet above it, where you're exhausting a tremendous amount of air, there would be, you would not notice that there was a spill. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I go ahead? I didn't know you were going. If, the, if there were no power to take another hypothetical, how would the exhaust work? Uh, there's a backup generator. There has to be a backup generator to be provided for it. Where is that? Uh, it's probably going to be on the roof right next to the unit. Thank you. Was that... Rob, my question. Um, sir, the two hour can you fire stand up so we can I'm hear sorry, you? The two because hour fire rated wall yes, construction? Sir. Do you know what type of construction is proposed? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, have, we have a full set of drawings. I can look it up for you. I'm just curious. I'm thinking about if you had sheet, double, no, double sheet rock, whatever, okay. the, the forklift carrying kind of something piercing through. I mean, right. Well, we, uh, we, we typically design 12 feet of block and then just press. That's good. No. For a forklift. That's good. The, the big concern is that you ship not it's almost like sharing a space. You are sharing so, space, absolutely so. So that's right. what our biggest one of our biggest concerns. Absolutely. And that's why we make sure that and and 
that we do this in shared spaces. Okay. So, I mean, when Bob talked about Farm Nation. Farm Nation is the second largest, uh, third largest flavor and fragrance company in the world, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, they have their own buildings. There are 70 facilities, and a lot of them share because they're not. They're, they're like vendors. They're, they're mid-tier in this market, and they share, and, and we address these issues about how to protect our neighbors from fire, from odors, from any bad feelings mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So 55-gallon drum is pierced, going back to that scenario, and so you have all that liquid on a, on a you said it would be a block wall? I'm just saying if you, if you, uh, if uh, any so the, the wall sill, the, the yep. floor base is, is sealed to prevent so any, sealed. yeah. So there, there's, there's no chance of it going under the wall and going into your neighbors. Okay. That's part of the construction requirement of a, of a firewall. Because okay. if you had a firewall and I could actually have liquid go underneath it, I could transfer the fire and completely bypass the wall. So anytime you have a firewall, um, there's UL, Underwriters Laboratory. To be an acceptable firewall, it has to have a UL number and they test just to make sure things like that don't happen. And this is a UL rated firewall. Okay, Mr. Scuderi. Uh, the ventilation system, that's working 24 hours a day even when a building's not occupied? Correct. So if there's a spill at night, it's not gonna affect any of the neighbors? Correct. Other than yes. Okay. And there would be a very <coughs> unlikely, I mean, if there was an earthquake and a drum fell off and you spilled it, but I mean, you're talking the most unlikely catastrophic thing for there to be a spill when no one's there. Mr. Sc uh, Mr. Grimaldi? I apologize, I forget from the original um, <coughs> project and when we uh, reviewed this. How tall are the ceilings, approximately? What are we estimating for 30, racking? Uh, racking, I think it's 36, I have to check. 32 feet clear. 32 feet clear. Yep, and 36, 39 feet to the top of the parapet, so you'll have five high racks which is the industry standard for a uh, pick from a, a, a stand-up reach truck. So Any other questions? How loud is the ventilation system? Um, it's not very loud and it's located in the center of the building. So... Because it's going around all night, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's yes, absolutely. It's, it's, not, it's not very loud. I mean, we have, we have performance data on it, but it's... Uh, there's there's requirements for all handling units how much noise they can generate. There's, there's codes regarding it, and so these are like courtesy state noise code is uh, 50 dB after 9 p.m. Yeah, and so these units are are green heck units. They're one of the largest manufacturer of air handling units, and so they meet all noise requirements for the state. Okay. Would they be as loud as a bathroom? No, they'll be louder than that. But, okay. yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're hoping your bathroom is quiet. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how bad or beat up the bathroom fan is, but yeah, no, they'll, they'll be louder than that. Be louder. Yeah. That depends who's in there. <laughs> Do we have any other questions for Mr. Farrell? Just kind of a last thing. So you're saying 20,000 CFM exhaust. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're taking about a half hour to change the air in the warehouse. Um, yeah. So about 36 feet total. Thousand, yeah, about 64,000 uh, cubic feet. I want to say 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, you should have an air changer every 20 minutes at that rate, I believe. Uh, 32 feet clear, uh, 20,060. Yeah, so yeah. it should be, it, it, yes, it's, there's a, you are exhausting a dramatic amount of air. So in any warehouse you've been at where you see little unit heaters on the wall and there's a little fan to keep the, the operators warm, this is an entirely different it's not that, yeah. It is not that. This is all of the air, 100% of the air in the building is, is exchanged every hour. I, I, I'm not certain. About three times an hour or twice an hour. Yeah, probably between two and, yeah, two and three times an hour. Anyone else? Nope. Okay, Mr. McNamara. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Farrell. Yeah, good test. You. Yeah, excellent test. Thank you.
Sir, could you raise your right hand, please? With regard to this application, do you swear the testimony that you shall give shall be the truth? Yes. Thank you. Could you state your name, spell your last name, please? Robert McFeeters, that is M C F as in Foxtrot, E A T E R S. As in Foxtrot? <laughs> okay. So people hear S. I'm sorry, what's your first name again? Robert. Robert, thank you. You got Foxtrot, you didn't get Robert? <laughs> <laughs> It's got my mind focused. Uh, <laughs> um, sir, for the benefit of the foreign public, would you please provide us with your background, education, and experience uh, in your particular field? Yeah, so um, I've got an uh, undergraduate degree in chemical and biomedical engineering from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll just, just kind of switch the places, yeah. maybe. So I should get here. Uh, so I've got an uh, undergraduate degree in uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and a master's in fire protection engineering from Worcester Polytechnical Institute. Uh, and I've got uh, eight years of experience in uh, fire and explosion protection engineering okay. professionally. You could raise that mic up a little, please. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Yeah. Better? Yeah. And, sir, if you could please provide the board with a description of your role in the development of the proposed facility for Ventos. Yeah, certainly. So uh, we were engaged back in uh, August, uh, 1st of August 2019 to provide fire protection engineering services uh, in the form of consulting. Uh, they uh, store combustible liquids and uh, they engaged us to provide a, a review and, and assessment of the uh, fire protection systems required for the facility. Uh, and that's uh, essentially what we provided in the form of a report. And how many of these types of facilities in the flavor and fragrance industry has your company designed both in New Jersey and elsewhere? Uh, as a company, uh, you know, probably 20 or 30, um, but, uh, you know, as far as similar hazards beyond the, uh, um, you know, fla flavor and uh, fragrance industry, you know, over 100, um, we uh, specialize in uh, industrial and, and uh, commercial storage occupancies when, uh, you know, either high hazard or, or high rack storage. And if you please go on to describe the type of fire suppression system that you, your firm has designed in conjunction with the architect and the company for the proposed facility. Yeah, uh, so the uh, fire protection system is based in part on uh, NFPA 30's scheme A, that's uh, National Fire Protection Association's uh, 30 is the uh, flammable and combustible liquids code. Uh, it's referenced by the uh, uh, New Jersey Building Code and New Jersey Fire Code um, for the design of the sprinkler system. Uh, the system is uh, a, co a combination of in-rack and uh, ceiling level sprinklers, uh, including solid barriers. Uh, so every other level of, of storage, or, or 12 feet vertically, you've got a, a solid plywood barrier with in-rack sprinklers underneath it. Um, what that does is moves the sprinkler closer to your potential fire point, uh, therefore you have faster reaction times and a more direct application of water to your, your fire. Um, the in-racks are supplemented by a ceiling level system which is designed for the surrounding occupancy, in this case um, class 4 commodities which are your ordinary combustibles or um, carton unexpanded plastics up to you know, as, as high as you can store them basically in this uh, type of occupancy. And for this type of building, if you could please uh, describe how these proposals are being maintained at the facility. Uh, so maintenance of the system would follow NFPA 25, which is the inspection, testing, maintenance of water-based fire protection systems. Uh, you know what that involves is uh, mainly protection or uh, testing of your uh, fire uh, pump. Uh, on, a, on a constant basis to make sure it's in working order. Um, the sprinklers uh, are, are more on a, a 5, 10, 30 year um, inspection uh, schedule. And of course, if a, a sprinkler were to erupt and break, it would become very evident uh, quickly to everyone that it was uh, not working and spraying water everywhere. Um, but uh, you know, generally, these systems are, are um, pretty low maintenance. That's why they've existed since the 1800s. What type of incident would result in potentially triggering the system to be activated? Uh, so outside of an uh, inadvertent uh, forklift smashing into a, a sprinkler head, um, the most likely fire scenario would be a, a pool fire in the rack storage area, um, you know, likely originating from the floor if, say, a fork truck pierced a 55-gallon drum and, and spilled its mm -hmm. contents on the ground and then somehow found an ignition source. Uh, and it, it's uh, under those circumstances that the uh, specific sprinkler protection system that NFPA 30 Scheme A is, is designed. It's a system designed for pool fires and rack storage. 
and the function of the underground tank that Mr. Lanzapama will testify to in greater detail in a moment. Um, if the system is activated, uh, house the water contained and then stored so it doesn't go off the outside of the building or off into the other uh, adjacent properties. Okay, yeah. Uh, so part of any H3 occupancy that has a uh, combustible liquid stored in it, uh, or flammable for that matter, is uh, the need to contain any sprinkler water or spill or leakage from, from contents. Uh, and, and there's a number of ways you can accomplish that. You can uh, you know, add curbs around the room to contain it, basically build a swimming pool. Uh, in, in this case, what we've done is provided drainage at every uh, opening or, or entrance from this, the, um, the building and uh, drain that to a outdoor storage container which is sized to contain the sprinkler water and uh, any spills from the uh, uh, you know, containers. And that's a dry tank with a capacity of 30,000 gallons, correct? Yes, correct. And this would ensure that no water would leave the premises, go on to adjacent property, or go into a local storm or sewer or combined storm sewer system in the area. Uh, yes, that's correct. It, it would uh, leak into the tank, um, contained in the tank, and then you'd have a you know, hazardous material removal um, company come and pump it out into their truck and, and dispose of it. How would it get to that tank? I mean, uh, is it through a series of pipes or is it overland? Yeah, so it's it's going to go um, underground. You, you probably have like a gooseneck to prevent passage of flame, right? right. And then uh, you know, underground piping to the tank itself, and then kind of like your, uh, I don't know if any of you are on septic, but that's right, how you remove it. Tank. Right. Yeah, okay. Similar. Mr. Lanza Fama will show the revised site plan where the location of the ground tank is and the interconnection of the system. Um, you were handed these. MSD issues earlier. I think you had a chance to review these prior to the meeting. Uh, no, these are different. Okay. So uh, just need a moment to review them. Uh, so, you know, just on first glance, uh, you know, these documents and with your background, it makes sense. These are all, um, uh, I guess, categorized by uh, OSHA's Global Harmonized Standard, uh, which is. Uh, you know, again, used by OSHA and, and followed to some degree by DOT, but uh, not the same definitions of uh, the fire and building codes, uh, which the, uh, they use the definitions that um, Mr. Farrell went over. And again, I'll just, I'll just touch on those briefly. So, so just so we don't run away. Yes. Earlier, Mr. Farrell testified that there was only combustibles, <clears throat> no flammables. Robert Shagendorf. Sagadoff? Sagadoff. Sagadoff. I'll get this tonight. <laughs> Testified that when he did his calculation, there was three ASDM sheets that he thinks, in his um, expert opinion, are flammable and not combustible. And what you're telling me that there is a separation between what he's reading and the way that the, the, the the DOT or the building and fire department read it? Yeah, and that reviewed. What I did, I, the only thing I did was I took the conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit. I was, I was, I was, and I did that on a calculator, so. Okay. I'm only assuming that we're basing on the, the chemical composition bed by flash form, am I correct? This is correct. Yes. If you, need, if you need a few minutes to look at that, I don't well, want to put you under no, the gun, because right, it's, it's a very important part. Well, it, I, we understand that there was a letter dated November 22nd, 2019 from the Harrington Group where the witness is employed to Mr. Alfano as the fire subcode official regarding these three mm -hmm. particular no, three, 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 three. Okay, the three that were in here were <coughs> lavender oil, citronella oil, and lemon oil. And these all had flash points above 100 or more Fahrenheit. These are not those three? No, these are, these are different. Okay, then I'm going to ask to give the witness a couple minutes to review them and then come back. All the time. Do you, if you want, you can continue with your testimony. Anything else you would like to say, but as, as the expert in the, in the chemical background, I think this would be your, your wheelhouse, right? Okay, yeah, certainly. Um, just for a yes. question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McNamara, you said that there was a letter sent to Mr. Alfano. Yes. Uh, has that been shared with the board? I don't know if it was or not, but I have extra copies here. That should be part of the record. Mr. Alfano, do you have that letter with you tonight? No, I do not. Do you okay. remember that letter? A couple. One was from consulting about a nine-page letter uh, arguing basically what was combustible, what's flammable. Uh, I'm sure you can wait until I saw it all the day on a 
submitted the plans to me and then I was able to submit it to the plans. I gave that. Oh, good. Let's mark this A5. That's a November 22nd letter? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have to be sure. Okay. Um, do you, before we, uh, Mr. Lovato, you have a quick question? Yeah, just, I, I mean, there's two things. I know you're reviewing those three chemicals you were just handed, but we don't know if they're actually part of this. Mm -hmm. Well, right. there's yet so far, right? right. We right. Have right. So there's two, in the object, two questions. Number one, if it's actually part of what they're going to be having there, those three chemicals. Mm -hmm. And number two, then he has to answer. So the flammable issue. For me, I, I agree with you, but I also think that this ASTM report was produced somewhere and we didn't give it to them, somewhere they gave it to us. Right. So if this is part of what you have going on in the establishment, we need to know a little bit more. I think you need to take a few minutes unless you already know. Mm -hmm. um, I think a ten minute break. You can take a five minute break and come okay, back sure. to us. Is that cool? That would be fine. I can bring Ms. Falan to Fama and sure. finish discussing the underground system. Okay. Rich. Yes. MSDS. Huh? MSD. What did I say? ASTM. Oh. That, that's another. I'm thinking of the plate yeah, around. I'm, I'm, yeah, another I'm sorry. That's all right. MSDS, not ASTM. It's the American Standard for Testing Materials. Yeah. <laughs> Still a good trick, so on. I do know my acronyms. <laughs> and my alphabet. <laughs> Board is still in session. Board is still in session, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Could you, uh, could you raise your right hand, please, with regard to this matter? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give some of the truth? I do. Could you state your name, spell your last name? Sir, my name is Michael Lanzafama. That's L-A-N-Z-A-F-A-M-A. -A -A. I'm a licensed professional engineer, land surveyor and planner, principal with the firm of Casey and Keller Incorporated. 258 Main Street, Northern New Jersey. I've testified before this board on numerous right. occasions. And, and you're calling him as an engineer? Civil oh. engineer. And, uh, and you were also previously before the board for the uh, prior application concerning this property and the adjacent property as well. That's correct. Yeah, right. As a project engineer. Mr. Lazar Thomas, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, if you could please. The license is still current. Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, if you could briefly describe the building and the proposed improvements, and in particular, <coughs> the location of the proposed underground uh, dry storage tank. Uh, and we have these plans, correct? Yes, you look, do. I right here. believe we do, yeah. Yes, okay. this is the, uh, the original site plan, which was amazing. Mr. Lenz, if I'm, I'm sorry, the stenographer needs you to kind of face her, I guess, because she's reading lips. <laughs> the uh, <coughs> property, as you know, is 20 Bowright. It's located on the northerly side of Bowright Avenue, uh, approximately 600 feet west of 14th Street. Um, the area that is being occupied by the proposed Ventos application is on the eastern side of the building, approximately 20,000 square feet. Um, the building, uh, as it was approved, has been completed. There's no modifications to the building or to the site uh, with regard to lighting, landscaping, number of parking spaces, impervious coverage that all remains the same. What we are doing, however, is installing a 30,000 gallon, 12 foot diameter by 41 feet long uh, subsurface fiberglass tank that well, was described by the prior witness um, that would store uh, the water that was generated by the fire suppression system should an event occur. And that would be collected by drains, four drains within the facility, taken by pipe into that containment vessel. Um, once the event was completed, a truck would be called in and that material would then be removed uh, from the site. Uh, once the installation of the tank is complete, uh, any disturbed area in that uh, location would be restored back to its original condition, so there is no uh, modifications required or site plan modifications that are necessary to complete the installation. Uh, just a point of interest is the, the location of the building uh, in the industrial zone is uh, particularly suited for this type of use uh, because of it being surrounded completely by commercial uses, 
Um, the University Park, Union County Park, is located to the north. It's an extensive area, uh, providing a buffer to the nearest residential properties, which are located on 14th Street, um, nearly a football field away. So you do have some separation and buffering between this particular use and any residential properties in the area. I think Sorry, that's well, you heard some prior questions from the board with regard to control of the traffic, and uh, Ignacio testified briefly that they anticipate one or two 18-wheelers a week in your occasional FedEx UPS delivery truck either coming in or going out. From your familiarity with the area, is that something that could be managed in a manner uh, that could accommodate the concerns of the community with regard to traffic? Uh, absolutely. The building itself, as it is originally presented to the board, had a significant number of loading bays uh, along its northern facade. So it was anticipated that there would be traffic, uh, truck traffic, coming to this facility on a regular basis. One or two tractor trailers a week is actually much lower than we had originally anticipated uh, when the building was first uh, uh, perceived and, and presented to the board. Um, most likely the truck traffic would come in off of Route 22, down 14, and into the facility and return probably the same route. There's nothing specific we have in the way of information about uh, truck traffic at this point, but that, that's what I would surmise. And the nearest schools are the David Drury Middle School and I believe High School? And the High School, correct. And this traffic wouldn't really impede traffic going to or from those schools when the kids are being dropped off or picked up in the afternoon. That's correct. Thank you. I have, further, I have no further questions of the witness at this time, Mr. Chairman. I have a few. Go ahead. <laughs> With this tank, <clears throat> you said it's how long? It's 41 feet long. 41 feet long, it's, and it's a 30,000 gallon tank. Correct. And it's that, 43 feet long. 43. Okay, and how deep is that going into the ground? Well, it's, it's 12 feet in diameter, and it's going to have uh, probably about a two foot of cover, so it's going down about 14 feet. Well, it's going to be 12 feet in diameter, two foot of cover, but you're going to have to get lower to pour a concrete pad correct. or some type of subgrade with stone in order to anchor that down so we have no uplift, correct? That is correct. The manufacturer shows a um, uh, an anti-flotation device to, right. to get, give it weight while it's empty. And that's going to be completely covered with concrete except the hash, is that correct? Cur well, it's going to be covered with the asphalt. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's going to be actually covered with concrete, but it's under the asphalt. It's under the asphalt. And the, and the access point, is, there's an access point to get in there if you had to will have a concrete, it will be encapsulated in concrete with a steel lid and a lock. That's correct. It also has a ventilation system. That's and, correct. Okay. Now, you have water going in there from the, um, from the uh, ground water. Let's call it the ground water from the drains inside the building. From, from Not ground, ground water. water. No. no. Roof drains? Not roof drains. drains. You have the water or any floor. type of substance from the floor going into the drains that are going to go into this tank. That's correct. <clears throat> Do you have backflow devices and check devices, check valve devices in those lines so nothing comes from the tank and goes back into the building? Uh, I, I didn't design that system. I would have to check with okay. the MEP. There's, is there someone here that can speak to that? If not, we'll, we'll, we'll ask again. But. The thing is, it's either going to be, it will have to be an inline check valve and or backflow, mm -hmm. and it should be a secondary means in case that one gets just functional. Right. Okay. Do you know what you're going to encapsulate that tank with, be it sand, pea, gravel, stone? Um, most likely it would be a sand material. Okay. Um, okay. Because with these two... I'm sorry? Okay. The plans don't show any details of what they testify to. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're going to have to make it conditional if there is a vote tonight. Because they don't show groundwater elevations, they don't show mm -hmm. monitoring wells. Exactly. That's yeah, where I was going. I don't know where you're going with this. So there was nothing shown in the plan before. So I would say you got really have to do it there. No, we'll design it to the appropriate yeah. standards. And if mm -hmm. that has to include a backflow cover, then yeah. we'll certainly make sure that gets installed to the satisfaction of your code officials. Okay. And certainly, as we go to construction design, 
we'll work with the air code officials and the manufacturer to make sure that every precaution that needs to be taken in the design is done, that the right film material is used, that the right foundation is set for the tank to keep it balanced since it's fiberglass and not steel, uh, so that it's designed in a way to uh, provide that secondary means of water going into it if it's coming out of the building. I'm sure, but Mr. McNamara, this is a very intricate part of this entire design, mm -hmm. and this here I feel should have been provided what do you uh, think? now, so I can understand better what's going to happen with dewatering, what's going to happen if we start excavating and you find, let's say, compromised soil, mm -hmm. is there going to be an LSRP on board, all those things are um, really an important factor, not just which is also an important factor, not just the flammability, the combustibility. What are we doing in order to make this entire system work? This is a very big hinge on what you're about to, to do here in this building. Understood, sir. So I would really appreciate something very thorough in where that soil is going to go, what's going to happen to it, um, what's, what is the composition around that tank, be it a geotextile fabric, a Marafi 140, if there's going to be a pea gravel there with a secondary means for water to escape. Uh, the backflows and the check valves is so very important uh, in, in a, something like this because we also have to look at the, the, the floodplain in that area as well because there's a lot of things going on at once. There's, there's more movable parts under the earth in, in this project than there is with the oil and the fragrances. So this is something that we need to really talk more about. Understood, and we'll be prepared to work with you code officials to do everything possible to meet your concerns in working with contractors as is designed. And if necessary, we can certainly retain the services in, of an LSRP if we think that's necessary during the construction phase. Uh, and to make sure that if there's issues about a historic fill or other unsuitable soil, that it gets addressed as part of the contingency and the construction process of having the tank installed. So we make sure that it's installed properly with the right type of material surrounding it and with the right type of interconnections to make sure it functions as designed. Mr. Benegro, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think what we can do is offer it to be, if there is an affirmative vote for approval, we can meet with the plumbing sub code official and myself to go over, because exactly like you stated, if you have a vent, um, the material that becomes gaseous, you need a check valve system. Not only that, this becomes a floor drain system. So if there isn't a spill from a chemical just washing the floors, you're going to have wash water get into the system. So they'll have to hire someone like Lorca to pump this out and test it. So I think what we'll do is we'll meet with the fire, I mean, the plumbing code official on how to handle this tank and its access ports and how to pump it out. It has to be pumped out. So to my point, uh, and I don't want to stress too much over this, but what's very important to me is that if you have those chemicals on that floor going into that tank, and now you have other chemicals that you're going to do a wash down to that floor, mixing with what's ever going into that tank, what is the adverse effect to that? So I think we need to talk to that as well. We'll be prepared to address that with the code officials and, and, and work through those issues to make sure, because in a lot of times, if there's a spill, it's a dry material that's used to absorb it, not uh, a wet or a water type cleanup. A lot of times you can clean with certain materials using a powder or, or something akin to something as basic as kidney litter. So you're talking about like the, what the mechanics would use, like a speedy dry, put right. it down, they right. get that up? Exactly. But now what happens when you wash the floors? At some point, you're going to have to hose down your floors to clean your warehouses and things like it's that. It's not done on a, on a very regular basis. It's usually you're not going to have spills or other items that are going to require to be mopped up. I don't think I'm talking about spills. I'm talking about general cleanup. Okay. A lot of it is done usually with dry broom rather than with wet because you just don't. It's just not the, the common practice. But I can, we can certainly bring our operations people to meet with the code officials here to describe those maintenance issues to demonstrate how it's handled to address that issue. So, um, okay, I, I just, I just find it uh, from a gentleman who owns uh, a few warehouses. Uh, after I dry broom the floor, I wash it down because I know 
coming in and out from the yard, it tends to get dirty and what have you. I'm not trying to beat the point, I'm just trying to get to the it's point. It's a valid point, I understand, sir. If you'd allow me one more. Sure. Please. But I would really assume that, again, the floor drains are going to be tied to this tank. There will be no interconnection of the floor drains to any sewer system. Because that would be, that would be a violation of the EP requirements. So this system is going to have to be a dry system pumped out by a carrier. That's why I said that was pumping so So there will be no interconnection for this tank to the sanitary or storm system. Okay. They can't bump this site. Then what happens with the fact that you know the plumbing officials kind of have to require possible support there for and the, that would have a side. Is that that will be a separate system. That's a separate no, the, the, same, the, separate the kitchen sink type stuff is totally separate. That's separate. There's nothing to do with the system here. This that goes into the sanitary, not into the water. Right, the correct. Well, that's why they have to do anything else. Can we just hear from Robert before we go on? No, I just said that, no, I was just making a remark that I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Also, I'm assuming it's a double wall tank. I no. believe so. No, it's a so single wall fiber glass, I'm sorry. Fiberless. All right, so then you're going to have, um, you're going to have any kind of chemicals going in there for fragrances at all, which is a potential, right? The high level alarm on the tank. All right, you, you know, so obviously you yeah. have to know when to pump it out. But, and, um, you know, I think you need to follow the chemical code and, and some of the codes also. Okay. I'd like to recall Mr. Farrell. Absolutely. Well, before, before we go there, just give me one second. We have another, we have two more questions. Okay. David, please, uh, can you just give a little bit of your background so everybody knows who you are? David Pringle, I have a 30-year uh, degree from Princeton University and also study organic chemistry at Princeton University. I'm sorry, Princeton University, uh, biology degree, and I um, also studied organic chemistry at New York University. Uh, I have been um, working in the legislative and regulatory field on environmental matters for my entire 30-year career testified hundreds of times before land use boards, legislative committees, EEP, BP1, um, all of them. There's an environmental law that I don't have my fingerprints on from us um, 30 years. Okay. Um, Your so question? A question on that tank. Um, uh, there's a stream, I believe it's a black rope, within roughly 200 feet of um, the building. Immediately to the north, yes. Um, so um, I can't imagine that the ground water level on the site, I haven't studied it, um, has to be a lot less than 14 feet. So how is, you know, there, there seems to be, I would think there's going to be a lot of groundwater, um, you know, contact with the tank. How is that? going to work 10, 20 years down the road? Well, we would certainly have to design it to meet not only what the representative of the company warrants, but to meet all appropriate code standards. And if we need to excavate and replace soil that's there, or if we need to put some type of uh, additional monitoring system on the tank, akin to what you do with a gas tank, uh, some type of cathodic protection or some other device, uh, if that's necessary, we can. But Mr. Chairman, if you'll allow me to call, recall Mr. Farrell, he has Absolutely. an alternative that we'd like to briefly discuss and give the board the option of directing us, which may assist in resolving the issue. Absolutely. Mr. Mr. Farrell, you've been previously sworn and qualified, sir. Yes, sir. And you're, you previously testified your firm has designed uh, facilities like this for companies in the flavor and fragrance industry well in excess of 300 facilities, correct? Correct. Uh, well, Mr. Lanzafamo was answering questions. You pulled me aside and said there's an alternative design that could be utilized here potentially that would eliminate the need for the storage tank. If you could briefly elaborate on that, please. Yes. So uh, the requirement for the storage tank comes from uh, a need for secondary containment. The secondary containment requirement is 110% of the largest vessel stored, which is 55 gallons plus 5.5, so 60.1 or whatever, something like that and then 20 minutes of fire water. So based on the occupancy of it, we have a 30,000 gallon tank. Based on the size of the building, we can provide curbs and, and little ramps in the concrete that would provide containment within the space for the 30,000 gallon requirement that we need, and we would have no exterior tank. At which point, if there was ever a sprinkler discharge, everything would be contained within the building, which is an alternate an allowed code alternate for storing and, and not having secondary. We wouldn't have any floor drains in the building. Everything would stay in the building. 
There would be curbs and ramps around all the doorways around the perimeter to make sure that nothing left the building and we would have enough containment to store the 30,000 gallons that we have proposed in the tank right now. So this, this would keep everything in the building and then there would be nothing. Then if there was an issue, they would come in and clean harbor, whoever had to do that would clean up the building and, and get rid of all the fire water from inside the building. So what I'd like to propose, Mr. Chairman, is that the applicant would be prepared to demonstrate both alternatives to all your code officials as a condition of approval. And if the municipal code officials felt that one alternative was clearly preferable to the other from a design, safety, maintenance, and functionality standpoint, the applicant would agree to pursue that option. Okay, I have no problem with that at all. Uh, the thing is, it has to be thorough, and I, for me, I would feel- For our lenders and our insurance carriers, we agree it has to be thorough, and yeah. our landlord. Right, so in, with that being said, I would much rather see the tank than the curb and have it contained there, because that um, also, in my experience, becomes a slop. And uh, even though it's great in design and theory, it doesn't really work the way it's designed to work. With people going in and out, you, it just becomes messier than the tank. I'd like to see, it's not for me to decide alone, but in my mind, the tank option is the way to go, but as long as we have all the moving parts together. Uh, that makes it work. Now, if this was to be approved tonight, that would be contingent upon you and your team getting together with Dave, Robert, and our team to make all of those moving parts work the right way. Understood, and we're fully prepared to do it. Perfect. Yes? Uh, one question with the tank maintenance, really. If you have a fork truck operator who hits a sprinkler head, shut down after 10 minutes, half your tank's filled. What's your time period to get that pumped out? Is it pumped out immediately? Is it three days? Because now we're going to have half a tank uh, filled for however long if you have a fire that night. Or we, we would call for service immediately. We'd have a contract with the Clean Harbors or other company that's available on notice, and uh, we certainly be prepared to supply the borough with that contact information and give that contact information to your appropriate code officials so they know who we're dealing with so they understand we're not using Joe flyby nights, we're using a reputable licensed service that knows what it's doing and it's also going to properly dispose of that wastewater because I don't want to knock on the door one day from DEP enforcement saying remember that 15,000 gallons you had something to take out of that tank? It wound up in the wrong place. And earlier in my career, I did a lot of super fun work, spill fun work, uh, spill act work here in New Jersey. I, and I've had clients get that knock on the door. It's not fun. But so, that would be done on an immediate basis. Then, as, as soon as, as we can get a service there, yes. Okay. So we're talking about uh, talking about the tank. We're talking about dewatering. We're talking about if and if we have to an LSRP on site. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the materials that need to contain a tank. What the tie down is. Everything surrounded that tank with backflow check valves and how we're going to maintain a tank. Yes, Very sir. simple. Yes, Mr. Gomaldi. Two last things with that. One, since you were proposing this tank, has anybody done or proposing to do any subsurface testing to find out where the water table is? Uh, I don't know if that was done prior to, but we would certainly anticipate having to do that as part of the design build of this system and whatever additional replacement we would need if we'd have to change out soil, create a different bed for the uh, fiberglass tank, because unlike a steel tank, there's a lot less tolerance. It's got to be balanced properly in a cradle usually, so it sits evenly, so it distributes the contents evenly, just like you would if you're using a fiberglass tank for a uh, underground tank to supply a gasoline station. You have to take the design, same type of design parameters here. So the, the tank is supported with deadman, which mm -hmm. is concrete deadman, and then it's anchored down. So because you have an empty tank that you're bearing, obviously buoyancy is another concern that you have, uh, that there's any, any rise in the water table moving. So the deadmen are put in, and the entire the tank design is, is based on that, and the, the calculation the field, and, yeah, and the tank manufacturer provides the, the deadman requirements to achieve for that specific soil patient or site. You would sure. also have to fill the tank at three quarters of the way in order to complete your construction with clean water, then pump that out once it's in place, and then... Yeah. And then you're good to go. Good. And there should be a liquid sensor in there as well. 
so that there's an alarm. That's I think I think we're good. I did, well, you we asked the other you. question to that. The tank has a vent on. Yeah. Correct. How are you handling that vent? Uh, in what regards? Because now it's just open to the air. So it, there, there's a spill, there's a cleanup, there's a fire, there's whatever. All that fragrance is in the tank now. And now it's just open, so, uncontrolled uh, to the environment. You should never have, the, what's going to be in the tank, in the fire or spill, is fire water. So we, we the, the, the design of the tank is 110% of the largest vessel, which is 60 gallons, and then 29,940 gallons of fire water. So there is not, it's not that you're filling that with fragrances or oil, you're filling it with fire water. The, the design of the tank and the requirement in the code so is the, to control. The testimony is that the dilution, the fragrance would be diluted to a point where it can be vented directly to the environment. And the, you can vent these directly to the environment, and we are. As we do yes, uh, the repack, the, we are directing it vently to the environment right now. So there is, it's, there's not a hazard, there's not a, an issue with that in any regard. I think what we've already done is uh, address the hazard by putting the tank. And we have to think about some of the sacrifices that we're going to have. And one of the sacrifices is there's a vent on it, and there has to be a vent on it. Yeah. And if there's something that emits from that tank, it's going to be addressed immediately. It's not the natural course of, of what's going to happen there every day. They've taken the, um, the CFMs through the, the, the exhaust through the large CFMs through the roof. This is in the worst case scenario. So on that one, you know, it's like uh, anything else. I think we've addressed the tank pretty well. Yes. So my question is kind of like a summary type to what? a summary type to you and our professionals. So we've talked about a lot of things. We've asked a lot of questions. We got a lot of answers, and yet pretty much the documents that you submitted aren't complete for the most part because of all these, well, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll get together with Victor and, and Kevin and you guys over there, um, and we'll make everything work and we'll get together with our subcode officials. So I guess my question to the board is, uh, can we really, if we were to approve this application, can we really do it with all the contingencies that you're gonna have to include? We, in we only have, Nick, to your point, I, we have, one contingency with a lot of letters underneath it, like how is it going to be done, this and that. Oh, with the, the, conti yeah. the contingency is the tank. I mean, if oh. this board was to approve this application uh, with the contingency that they would have to give us all the information about the tank, how it's going to be installed, and everybody is all warm and fuzzy, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. If they didn't design 17 other things, if they talked about the roof vent, if they talked about uh, they didn't have a containment room, then we would look at this and say, fellas, go back and do your homework. I think they've done everything up to this point. I don't know why this point wasn't done. Right, but, but, I, I but think it was a relatively recent change to the building design. When we had to come back in, we were told we needed site plan. That's when the issue came up, and we then went to the manufacturer and got the specs for the tank. It was not part of the original design. We had to make an amendment to that after we got feedback from the borough's officials. That's why we wound up showing the location. Mr. Lanzafama stepped in, did some of the basic design work, contacted the manufacturer, got the specs. Um, so we've been trying to get there to address that, recognizing that anything that's done with the design, anything that's done with the construction is going to have to be done in direct co uh, consultation and oversight of all the code officials of the borough to their satisfaction, otherwise you're not going to issue a CL. Right. You've got, you have the ultimate hammer. Well, the, th the thing is also, this board, um, we've had a lot of applicants before us that would come in and give us a, a shaky piece of paper and have, at the end of the day, 25 contingency items, and they wonder why they did not get approved. So what I'm seeing is, although Nick is 100% correct, it should be spelled out for us, I think it's one item that is going to give us a complete um, pedigree of what you're going to do, uh, unless we see it. But, but we're going to have to include what Victor mentioned and a couple other people mentioned about those uh, 
groundwater monitors, right? Yeah. And the elevations for, for the uh, okay. we will, we will for the water as well as the field and the possibility of an LSRP so. tip. Well, we understand that. If you dig a hole anywhere in the state of New Jersey in an industrial area, you better have an LSRP ready just in case. I mean, that's just standard operating procedure under the amendments to the Spell Act, that you're, you're now operating with that person shoulder to shoulder, otherwise you're taking an unnecessary risk. Okay. Just so, I guess from you said you built, designed and built a few of these, or a large many of these facilities with fragrances. Do they all have this containment tank, or what do they normally you, use? Uh, or are yes. we just overkilling? No, no, uh, so th those are traditionally the two options are dikes and ramps, or um, the secondary containment tank. Okay. I personally prefer the secondary containment tank. Okay. Um, from a life safety point of view, by putting all the ramps in, um, I have an issue with, I have to ramp every door, I have to put all these, and so if there is an emergency, I love my client, but my, my number one job as an architect is life safety. If there is an emergency in this building, I have to make sure that all the people get out safely. And by, by putting on these other things, uh, I, I, I make it more challenging. It still meets the code, but so we typically put these tanks in, in these facilities. And this is true of any facility where we, I mean, we, we do other types of work besides. Cosmetics is one of our largest. L'Oreal is one of our largest clients, okay? And we've put these facilities in many of them manufacturing. And this is, this is the, the gold standard in, in this container. Okay, this is something that we do on a regular basis. And if I can, there's one other thing I did want to, to bring up because I wasn't up here. You had talked about washing the floors and that going down the drain. So the floors are, are washed with a floor washing machine, which actually puts the floor down and sucks it up. The same that you see at Home Depot or Lowe's, okay? When you're in anywhere, so, so no one's coming in with a hose and washing the floors. Um, so you shouldn't. The only time there should be liquid in the tank is if there's an emergency. Otherwise, there should never be. And so will there be separate floor drains from the drains for the tank? Any other floor drains going out to the... Uh, the only drains that are going out are the ones from, from the production area and the, the warehouse. From, okay. the, from the area where we have the repack, okay. there's, there's a drain there, and then there's a drain to keep... So, excuse me, sir. Let me get out of your way. I want to go back to this original. Okay, so, so we provide drains around here. We want to make sure no fire water or anything goes out the door. Okay. Okay, so we're containing... All of, of the fire water in the main building. Okay. Okay. So there's not. It's it's not like the floor drain that's in the bathroom goes to the tank. The floor drain in the bathroom goes to the sanitary sewer the way it does in every restaurant you go to. Okay. It's you know so it's entirely separate system. Separate system. Okay. The only thing that goes in here is in this area. Okay. And then goes from here to keep it from going outside the building and contain. Okay. That's good enough for me. Anyone else? David. Um, has there been any wetlands delineation? Because I'm now looking where the tank is, and it's the closest part to the system, and there's immediate vegetative buffer in through around any other transitional you know, wetlands transitional areas. And uh, required under it, it was reviewed under the original approval. There were no wetlands uh, buffered in this area. Okay. Anyone else for? Well, we were at, we were with Mr. Lanza Fong. Yes. Uh, and then Mr. Farrell, okay, what, you got something on? I'm good. I just, you good for now? Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Don't go away. I'm not here. I'm here until the very end. All right. Um, Mr. Lanza, when we talked about the facility, we talked about traffic, uh, you talked about the site being very suitable for this type of use given the nature of the zone. Is there anything else you want to add to your testimony at this time? No, just Thank you. I reserve the right to recall the witness if necessary. Absolutely. Anything uh, for Mr. Lanza, yeah. Gentlemen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Lanzafano, you talked about routing trucks perhaps to and from Route 22. Is there a way to make sure that they do indeed go north to 22 rather than south towards the boulevard? Uh, we would have to talk to the client and make sure that their uh, deliveries took that route. We would, have, we would talk to our delivery people and make sure that they understand that there are designated times and routes for entering and exiting to the operations to be conducted at the facility. And what would those times be? Uh, Mr. Lanzafamo, it would be window of 
7 to 8 30 a.m. minimize impact on uh, rush hour school traffic in this new uh, area of the community? I, I don't know if I could answer that question. That would have to be a time to avoid. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you if you give us yeah. direction that says you want our traffic, our trucks to come between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. when we sit to do our contracts, we'll tell them that's the slot of delivery that's been uh, dictated to us by the town, and we have to honor that as part of the approval we have for conducting our business. Mr. McNamara, this is this is something that's very important to us as well because mm -hmm. uh, just like your neighbor next door, Emirates. Uh, when they were here the last time, we discussed that very same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, depending upon the size of the truck, like the right. uh, 53 footers or the 18 wheelers, there's just no room for them early hours. Straight right. jobs or a van or a pickup, that's another story. Mm -hmm. But those big guys, they got to wait till 9 o'clock or after. But we'll give you some time. We have no objection. And if you find that there's a time slot that works best and minimizes any interaction with traffic and surrounding properties, we'll honor it. Perfect. Just I, mean, I grew up in that area and with shop cross trucking and union trucking mm. just to be a lot more trucks all times of day and night going yeah. through there so I think two a week is a lot less than there used to be in the past right that's just just a comment well the good thing about what they're doing is they're open from seven to five and there's not going to be trucks sitting there waiting for them overnight with engines running no there'll like be that. no so idling permitted that violate state law and that will we will tell our trucks you're turning it off, and these are not refrigerated vehicles or others that right. need to run a compressor or something else because of the nature of the product that's on there. And, but they'll be clearly instructed, no idling permitted as per state law. Okay. Thank one you more, very much. Yes, one more uh, question for Mr. Lawrence Palmer. It uh, has nothing to do with Bentos as a client, but on the original plan, as I recall, the, the bays in the back, mm -hmm. you had those 10 bays, but the last two in the corner was green space. How come you added two more? We came back for an amended approval. Oh, you when, did? Okay. Yeah, when the adjoining yeah. client came. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. so, yeah. No problem. I missed that part. I you were absent that day. I must have been, <laughs> <laughs> must have been absent that day. I don't, I don't remember Emmons coming in. So, yeah. Okay. Anything else for Mr. Lynn's comment? Okay. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McNamara? Yes, I need to recall a witness to respond to your uh, consultant's uh, issues with regard to the MSDS sheets. Is that Robert? Nick? Yes. And, and so your first name was? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just like to thank you for the time to uh, review these documents. Uh, Surely. But uh, yeah, on review of them um, is uh, is correct. So these would be classified as, as flammable liquids uh, under the International Building Code, Fire Code uh, okay. definitions. Uh, now, the discussion with um, the gentleman from Ventos, uh, they will not bring these into the building unless uh, permitted by code. Um, and uh, you know, I will say further that the uh, sprinkler system design, room design, uh, and all the protective features that are in the building currently are um, in place. Whether you would have flammable or combustible liquids, it's uh, uh, the H3 use group, which uh, that occupancy gets triggered after storage quantities of flammable or combustible liquids. Uh, it's where you have open use, where you've got the distinction between combustible and flammable that becomes important, and uh, that's when you can uh, trigger an H2 type of occupancy use group, which is a uh, fast burning fire or deflagration hazard. Now, um, that doesn't get triggered until you have open use of 1A liquids or 1B liquids in quantities greater than 60 gallons. We don't know uh, 1A or 1A is like, um, essentially it's, it's a vapor at room, just above room temperature. So um, that's usually not encountered except for specialty chemicals. Um, some grades of gasoline are considered that, but um, you know, that's, it's rare to see it, and, and your containers are typically pressure-looking type vessels. Uh, there aren't any 1A sort in this location, so, um, yeah, that... Okay. So, let me just recap well, a little... Yeah. Let me recap a little bit, too. So, we have three documents that were in a folder that you're saying now, with those MSDS sheets, um, Ignatio said to you, your client, that they will not bringing in, they will not be bringing these particular products in. Did I understand that correct? Yes, that's correct. So nowhere in that facility will those be. So we don't have to worry about that. Right. Yes. Okay. I thought you said if it's they won't be brought in unless permitted by code. But okay. Yeah. So, so is this the H three use group? So the, yes, this building is an H three use group. Okay, but but the three products. How can I, in the event there's an approval? For condition, how can I condition these three? 
So, um, what can I refer to them as? I guess caffeine, flammable, any yeah. flammable, flammable liquids, flammable, flammable, flammable pursuant. Uh, <coughs> and you can identify the three. We can give you the MSDS sheets. All right. Yeah. So let's let's digress a bit because. Earlier, we were talking about, or Mr. Farrell's testimony was that there was no flammable liquids in here, if I understood you correctly, and it was all combustibles. But now we're saying, if, if code allows it, these chemicals could infiltrate that building in some way, shape, or form. Is that correct? Well, I'll let um, Mr. Farrell speak. Yeah. Okay. Could you, could, you class, could you identify it as class 1A, 1B, and 1C flammable? As noted in this letter, so we can identify them by some. By. Okay. 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 Mr. Okay. Farrell, please. Okay, Mr. Farrell, you got the mic. Okay. So it's, it's important that we understand that Ventos has a palette of about 2,600 materials. You did not get 2,600 SDS sheets. You got a sample of the materials that they keep. Okay. And as part of our, our fit out here, we are not going to store combustible materials. No. I mean, no not no. flammables. We're not going to store flammables, excuse me. Correct. We're not going to store flammables. We're only going to store combustible components in here. Okay. Uh, what my colleague said was there's no difference in the code. So, from a code point of view, whether I store flammables or I store combustibles, there's no difference. The fire protection would be identical. All the work that I did would be identical. The secondary containment would be identical. We are just saying that the client has made a decision to only store combustibles in this facility. But by saying with that testimony, that doesn't mean he could not, if the code allows it, he could bring it in if he wants to. And then I would have to go to one of my experts and say, is that accurate? Yes, it is. It is. Yes, it, it, the code doesn't see a difference between the H3 is right. combustible or flammable. Yeah. But should the board wish to make a distinction, this is a use pairing application. Reasonable conditions can be placed in that resolution should the board feel favorably to this application. Right. What, what I'd suggest and, yeah, and Mr. is that say good. No flammable. Yeah, Mr. Pantina referenced Mr. Ha uh, the Harrington Group's letter of November 22nd. You have Class 1A, Class 1B, Class 1 3 flammables. So if we indicated in the event there's an approval that class 1A, 1B, 1C flammables are not permitted in the building, will that cover it? And will, will that? My client will accept that as a condition. Is, let's not beat the dead horse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Can you actually put that on as a condition then? in H3? We'll, we can. Sure, we'll accept it as a condition and we'll further accept as a condition, and I'm sure Mr. Rago can draft it that should my client wish to pursue those type of products in the future, it would require coming back here and getting a new D1 variance. Okay. Okay. How would the borough enforce that? You have annual inspections by all your code officials and... Okay. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The other means my client can deal with it instead of staging the material here in Kenilworth is arranged for direct transport so it doesn't come here and it goes from point of origin directly to customer. I don't want to lose I don't want to lose sight of uh, if this is approved tonight. I don't want to um, be detriment to the course of business that you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. If combustibles and flammables are okay in the eyes of the fire code. What I'm saying to you is I wouldn't like to see everything there. Mm -hmm. Why would I ask this board to uh, enforce a condition that doesn't necessarily need to be there and make it more mm -hmm. difficult for you in operations of your business? If it is okay for one, why isn't it okay for the other? That was my so, I, so I agree with you. So, so I guess to the point is, as much as I don't want to see them, if it's already, it's like we're rewriting the ordinance. I don't want to do that. If it's okay to have the flammable, and the, the, we have experts here that says it's okay, it's okay. If, Thank you. I, I would agree with you, Chairman. If, you. if our experts right. and their experts are saying that we are taking an abundance of caution and all precautions are 
in effect, whether or not they're there, right. I want our hopefully new Kenilworth tenant to be have the best chance of success Absolutely. in our town so that he could be here forever. So right. I give him that and, and that was my okay. point I was trying to make. Yes. Good to that good point. We're good with that? Yes, sir. All right. Ignatius, are you okay with that? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you might go back to the lesson five, right? <laughs> what? All right. What's next? My planner, my last witness. Right. Yeah. Let's do it. Thank you. Oh, David, did you have something? Yeah, I, was, I have a series of questions about the chemicals, and I'm not sure what is the best. Right. Kind of if it's about chemicals, about chemicals, you have the chemical here. expert here. That's you, right, uh, Robert? Yeah. No, fire protection has really two uh, fire protection. Oh, uh, that's all I really do. Who's the chemical expert? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you stop him, and then I'll find another witness. You can send everybody back to Spain. Just get Mr. Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> I will say they don't usually have this many people when I testify. Uh huh. Okay. So we'll we'll start, and I'll see, and then I'll ask. Probably my client is going to have to okay. support me. So, if I heard these correctly, there, Bento's offers up to 2,600 different flavors and fragrances in oh, theory. Yes, sir. So, some combination, in theory, any and all of those 2,600 could go before through this cycle. Correct. How many of them have material safety data sheets? All of them. 100%. Um, and they have to be accessible to all employees at all times during business operations. Mm -hmm. Usually, you have a computer where it can be called up. So that the person in the warehouse can instantly access that information to make sure the material is being handled properly. So even though there are roughly 85,000 chemicals out there with 60,000 of the 85,000 not having been uh, regulated in worst. Yeah, if they all have an MSD sheet, it's not coming in the building. Okay, Should that's good. Um, and of the, um, so the one to two trucks a week, how many 55 gallon tanks are in a truck? Oh, what do you do? 40 to 80, 55 gallon trucks. 20 pallets. 20 pallets. 20, 20 pallets. 20 pallets per truck. Okay. That's what you can get. So you can get four pallets on a, you can get four drums on a pallet, 20 pallets in a truck. Okay. Just, yeah, just, just trying to get a general scope. Um, 43,000 pounds on the truck. And, um, is, is there uh, will be depending probably depending on what the market will bear or are of the ones that are a lot of these are a lot more toxic than others. So what are the ones that are more likely to have more volume than less volume? It, that that that's purely from a sales point of view. So it depends on what the clients are. Could we get? Let me some? ask my client, but Ignacio, approximately the percentage of flavor versus fragrance. Your ingredients roughly go to a food two thirds of the time, roughly. Two thirds of the time, they are allowed to go to the food. So the chemicals that are there in the agricultural flavor house are fit for human consumption, leaving your facility to that company, Correct. and that covers about two thirds of the overall amount of product you're going to have at this facility. Correct. Thank you. Okay, I got to just ask everybody to do me one favor. Because we have audio and video, we need to get a little bit more clear to the cam uh, to the mic so we know who's speaking and what is being said in case we have to review this. So Mr. Ignacio and everybody else who wants to come up, <laughs> come on up, but we have to make sure, and you're still on the oath. Okay, um, just for the record, um, approximately two-thirds of the products you're going to have at this warehouse facility are food-grade quality. Correct. And fit for human consumption. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Um, and what is the maximum amount of product that might be stored at any given time on, on the site? Uh, the raw I, 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 would, I would have to get back to you on that. Because the quantity is unlimited in the, in the use group, it, it's going to go into our, what's in our racking. What was this sprinkler system designed for? Oh, Again, sorry. Robert, I can't hear that. Uh, I, you have question, to speak clearly. Sorry, part, I think part of the question was, what's the system, what is your system designed for? Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. So, uh, the, the, sorry. Uh, so, it, are you talking about like the maximum amount of liquids that can be protected by the system? Yes. 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 So, uh, sprinkler systems are designed by area and density typically. So, you, you, you aren't anticipating more than one fire in a location, but what you are anticipating is to be able to control that one fire 
to a single uh, area that you're designing a sprinkler system to. So uh, the specific system that's being installed, the in-rack and uh, solid barrier system with the, the uh, ceiling level sprinkler system, uh, it's designed for operation of uh, uh, 12 in, or sorry, eight in-rack sprinklers uh, to operate simultaneously. Uh, the testing upon which it is based and, and no test did it exceed more than uh, four sprinklers operating. Um, so the system is, in my opinion, adequate for the, the hazards. Uh, and it's not like you'll have a, um, a fire that's spraying the whole building, uh, unlimited fuel. You're, you're trying to control it, uh, control it uh, into a certain location and stop spread. And that's what it's designed to do is stop spread. So um, the area it's designed for is, you know, uh, two bays and then across the bay um, plus, plus some, you know, uh, safety factor that the testing lab that developed it uh, put into it. So um, I guess it's adequate because it's designed to control it in place. In, um, yeah. and I think I just have two more questions. Um, so 40 to 80, 55 gallon drum, drums per truck. How many drums, 55 gallon drums, could be stored safely on site total? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, tech, yeah. technically yeah. as many as you could fit in the, the, the yeah, rack. So, so, I guess, so, so but that doesn't answer the question. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, and then finally, un unfortunately, when something goes wrong, normally it doesn't go wrong in a vacuum. There's a series of things that go wrong. It's not just like you lose power, but then it's because of a tornado that tore up something or whatever. So, could you elaborate a little bit more on the? I mean, there's the backup system, but are there's you know, what kind of backups to the backups to the backups? Yeah. I'll just, for example, when we had um, Hurricane Sandy, it um, it wasn't well covered, but uh, Oyster Creek Nuclear Plant, which is right on, on the water there, came within a couple feet of their backup generators being underwater. They had already lost electricity um, from, the main, from the main grid. They almost lost their backup generators and had the water got a little higher, we would have had a lot more problems than we did. So, previously <laughs> test by the generators are up on the roof. Correct. Okay. So uh, there will be one, yeah, so the, the current design includes one uh, get natural gas fire generator which will operate in the case that there is a power loss serving four uh, air handling units. Okay, so there's one exhaust fan, one makeup air unit for the uh, recap room, two makeup air units for the uh, main space, and then two exhaust fans for the main space. So that's what that generator services. It's on the roof, and that's the, the code the, the, the backup generator is the code required redundancy. And so you're going to have a general backup to the platform? I, could, I couldn't hear that, Mr. Alpha. You're going to have a backup generator to the platform. Yeah, this is a fire pump. Um, so, uh, yeah. uh, so with, with the, uh, the fire pump, um, if it's electrical pump and uh, the electrical utility in the area is considered reliable, um, typically, it's an acceptable method of uh, arranging it um, such that you know the likelihood of losing power and having a fire are so remote that um, it's it's a you know acceptable alternative to say, um, of course, areas where you don't have a reliable um, you know, electrical utility, you'd have to go to say a diesel powered generator or a diesel pump, um, something where you 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 would have that survivability, um, and uh, yeah. So, if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, also, um, the uh, amount of water coming out of each head, up to say the ceiling, it's uh, a density. What would be the densities? Fifty-seven. So um, the indirect sprinklers themselves, each each head would deliver fifty-seven GPM at full design. So you know, the first one's going to deliver significantly more, but um, you know, as each goes, you know, fifty-seven gallons per minute That's over a you know four foot square area. Uh, and, the and the ceiling level is, is an ESFR uh, K16.8 at 52, and I think that's over a gallon per minute. Um, so it's. Two gallons per, per uh, minute? It, it, per, per square foot, sorry, a gallon per minute per square foot of, of area. So it's it's a prodigious one, amount of water. It's a lot. Which would be 100 gallons per minute. Yeah. It's, I want to say ESFR is 100 gallons per minute over 12 minutes. Uh, it's, it, it, each head is about 121 gallons per minute, right? So. Um, so and that's, 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 that's the reason why we have a 30,000 gallon so yeah, that's, that's It's, it's 1.2 gallons per square foot. So, uh, so, gentlemen, we've got to have one person talking at a time. It's like an open forum, so please, we've got to have some order. All right? We, we need to hear you, and we need to know who's speaking. 
And apologies, one final question. Um, in the repack room, would there only be one um, chemical in there at any given time? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. You might as well just hang out. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Let's just before next week. Okay. Who do we have? I just had two. Oh, Robert, go ahead. Who's who your question? Mr. Farrell, and that's it. I, Mr. Farrell. So close. I was so close. Yes, Staff accumulation, bonding and grounding? Uh, bonding and grounding only in the repack room. Perfect. So there's one drum, there'll be a ground bar. Perfect. Material handling methods for the drum transfer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very candid with you because I looked on the internet on the website and I see a drum on the forklift, on the blades of the forklift. And I don't think that's going to fly in. So, so, so we typically, I mean, our, our design would be a drum runner. So a fixed drum runner. No, and that's what I was prefer to say. So a drum runner would, would then be for the manual. So is that... That's correct. Yes. So for clarity, you're not yeah. picking up the drums with the forks. You're picking up the pallets with the forks and a drum runner for each yes. individual drum. For those drum. that don't know, what a drum runner is, is it's a single drum hydraulic system where you actually clamp yeah. the drum onto it and there's hydraulic to pick it up and lift it. The concern uh, that was had was that some institutions will actually cradle a drum on its side in between the forks and use that as their means with which to dispense mm. and that obviously uh, provides a lot of risk. Yeah. That's why there's specialized material handling for it. And that's what's going to be employed by my client. Okay. So Definitely a drum runner. So uh, yes. Not a rum runner. <laughs> a drum runner, yes. That's it's later. Let's get late. Okay. It's only one day. <laughs> what else we got? Monday? <laughs> Let's do it. Hey, Tony. Could you uh, raise your right hand, please? With regard to this application, do you swear the testimony you're about to give somebody the truth? I do. Would state your name and spell your last name, please. Yes, Nicholas with an H, Graviano, G R A, V as in Victor, I A N O. Thank you. I'm a planner and partner with Graviano and Gillis, uh, architects and planners with a business address of 101 Crawford's Corner Road in Homedale. Mr. Graviano, your license as a professional planner is still current? Yes, it is. And you've been accepted by numerous land use boards for the state as an expert in the field? Yes, I have. Have you testified here previously? Yes, I have. And been accepted as an expert? Yes, I have. Thank you. Uh, We're fine. Mr. Graviano, uh, as a professional planner, you're familiar with the standards needed for the applicant to prove the requirements to secure a D1 variance. If, if you could please provide us with your professional opinion as to how the applicant has demonstrated it satisfies the proposed requirements. Yes, uh, the applicant is before you this evening uh, for a preliminary and final site plan approval with associated D variance for a specific piece of property, otherwise known as Block 6, Lot 3.01. Uh, the applicant's sole variance that they're requesting this evening is the D1 use variance. There is no other bulk relief requested or required as part of this application. Now with respect to the D variance, uh, this board has the power to grant uh, D1 variances for non-permitted uses in particular cases and for special reasons. This is otherwise known as the positive criteria uh, of a D1 use variance. New Jersey courts have held that the promotion of the general welfare amplifies the meaning of special meetings the most. Uh, so therefore, in a typically inherently beneficial use application, which this is before you this evening, although I would contest that you know covering up smells and stuff like that is inherently beneficial, this is not an inherently beneficial use application. The standard that you must employ to determine whether the special reasons have been proven is whether proposed use will promote the general welfare and whether the development of the property is particularly suited for the very use that is proposed. The courts have held that particular suitability does not require the applicant to demonstrate that there are other locations within the borough uh, to accommodate this type of use, just that this site contains characteristics that is good for the very enterprise that is proposed. 
Moving on, the applicant must uh, meet the negative criteria where uh, no substantial detriment to the zone plan or zoning ordinance uh, must be demonstrated. With respect to the uh, zone planning zoning ordinance, uh, the applicant must prove and the board must find by an enhanced quality of proof that there be no substantial impairment of the zone plan or zoning ordinance and the applicant must reconcile the use proposed with the ordinance's admission of the use from those permitted in the zone. Now when you look at the uses permitted in the zone, and I'd like to just discuss the purpose of the industrial district which is found in section 120 of your code. Uh, the purpose of the zone is to design and protect and concentrate those commercial, industrial, and manufacturing uses that are currently viable and those sites for which industrial and commercial reuse is feasible and probable. It is also designed for those industrial and commercial uses which have min a minimum of environmental impacts but have vehicular traffic, utilitarian, or operational requirements that make them more appropriately located next to major arterials and compatible land uses rather than residential uses. And you heard Mr. Lanzafama discuss in his testimony how this is an industrial area. It is an industrial building surrounded by additional industrial uses. Moving on, you, you look at the permitted land uses uh, in the industrial zone. Firstly, you have activities of industrial nature and associated office and clerical activities. Um, you have public garages, automotive repair shops, new, vote, new vehicle sales, uh, used vehicle sales in conjunction with new vehicle sales. Storage warehouses are also permitted. Uh, lumber and building material sales. Uh, the processing and assembling, uh, packaging and storing of goods and materials, metalworking and welding, um, retail establishments, uh, restaurants, taverns, uh, medical and vet offices, child care centers which are in volatile use of another nature as long with another uh, mix of, of commercial uses. So you have a wide range of permitted commercial uses many of which have many of the flammable and combustible materials that have been discussed at length here this evening. So therefore you have a use that is not a substantial departure uh, from what is permitted by right uh, in an extensive list of permitted land uses in the district. Uh, moving on to the master plan, your 2011 master plan identifies the industrial goals and objectives, uh, mainly uh, allowing the expansion of uses in the industrial zone to permit more e economic activity, uh, to promote the growth of industrial uses by taking advantage of area <coughs> transportation infrastructure, and to um, provide the adequate infrastructure to meet the needs of industry. So here you have also have a worldwide user looking to come into the borough uh, for an operation that also helps accomplish the goals and objectives of the 2011 master plan. Moving on to the analysis of the positive criteria and the advancements of purposes of zoning in the municipal land use law. This project helps advance purpose A the promotion of the public health, safety, and general welfare through a highly modern and, and uh, impeccably designed uh, through a code standpoint industrial use. In addition, it helps promote purpose G, sufficient space for in appropriate locations for a variety of commercial industrial uses to meet the needs of New Jersey citizens. With respect to the negative criteria, as I discussed in the analysis of the master plan uh, and the zoning ordinance, there is no substantial impairment of the zone plan or the zoning ordinance. Uh, this is very uh, compatible to uh, many of the permitted uses within the zone. And the, the use itself uh, can be mitigated simply like other uses in the zone are mitigated for the safety of the community through strict enforcement of all applicable building codes and regulations uh, which are governing such use. So therefore, I think this applicant easily meets the positive and negative criteria with respect to the D1 use variance analysis. Anything else? Any questions to the Mr. Chairman? Anyone like to speak to Mr. Barbiano about anything at all? How about our professionals? Does anyone have any questions for the planner? 
No questions, Chair. No questions. Mr. McNamara? Uh, Mr. Cravio is my last witness, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the board taking so much time and diligence in reviewing our application and ask that it be acted upon favorably by the board this evening. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hey, McNamara. Public questions for anybody. Okay. Yeah. Be before, before we open the meeting to the public, I just want to make sure that any member of this board have any questions to our professionals, the professionals that are out there, or anyone associated with this uh, application. It's, can I just ask one question? You can. For either, I don't know for Mr. Farrell up here, but <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, I kind of up, is there any um, his, uh, spills, fires in these facilities, the other ventos issues, or has any been any environmental hazard from coming out of ventos at all that you know of? Or? Yeah, I mean, no. no, great, perfect, thank you. Okay, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open the meeting to the, I'm going to get a motion to open the meeting to the public. Uh, uh, we need a motion to open the meeting to the public on this case and this case only. So moved. Moved by Mr. Ladati, seconded by uh, Mr. Scuderi, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this case and this case only? Seeing none. Oh, oh, someone here? I, I didn't see you behind the uh, the board. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. State your name and uh, address for the record, Chief. John Zimmerman, uh, Canada Police Department. My, I have one question that wasn't addressed tonight. I know we've talked a lot about fires and, and that kind of stuff. Hazardous materials and employees that deal with hazardous materials, like first responders responding there, the police department, we have a volunteer, fire department, volunteer, first aid squad. We get there before um, anybody else. So we are kind of jacks of all trade in this town. And I just want to know what we're going to be facing, if anything, in the way of, I know you said most of your things are human grade, the, the, the vast majority of them, but what are not and what are we facing? What do your, do your employees wear any protective gear um, when they deal in this specialized room or in the warehouse? And what do we need to concern ourselves with as first responders if somebody there calls 911 and they're having a heart attack in this room or in this uh, warehouse or whatever. There are no uh, specialized clothing requirements for people who work in the warehouse. Um, in a place where they're doing sophisticated blending or uh, modification of a product, you'd see them have to wear everything from the little booties and the cap over their hair to a much more heavy duty type of article of clothing. Uh, we're certainly prepared uh, prior to engaging operations to meet with you and anyone from your department will show you all the material data sheets, will walk you through the building. Uh, usually at least one, if not two, of the warehouse operators are hazmat trained and will certainly uh, be ready to work with your department to give people a tutorial on what's here, how the place functions on a daily basis, and what would they expect if they came there during the course of operations. Okay. Yeah, I know we do get hazmat reports as well as the fire department gets them, um, so that we're aware of what's on site. Do do your employees have to wear respirators or anything? No. Things <coughs> when dealing with lungs or in no. no. That's my primary concern as a first responder, making sure that there's no, you know, immediate uh, concern for us when we have to go into the building without having time to, to figure out what's going on. Good question. I'm very happy to work with the department in we can. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Anyone else behind that board that I don't see? Make a motion to close to the public. Second. Motion to close the public to Mr. Ladati, second by Mr. Scuderi. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, here we go. We, we've learned a lot of things tonight, and if you can appreciate why we had to call this special meeting from the last time that we were here is because we didn't have our professionals here last time and um, somewhat unprepared. We didn't have our fire official here who, who uh, prepared a document which we needed to learn more about. And as you can see, uh, this board was quite thorough in the questions that we asked. And uh, my hat's off to you, Mr. McNamara, to put, putting together a fantastic team with a wealth of knowledge that was straight to the point, uh, didn't jade any questions, and it made it easier for us to understand the type of business that they're in and um, how they want to proceed. 
So to recap a little bit, uh, I can say that we understand that the business hours are from 7 to 5. The trucks will be coming in uh, two trucks to three maybe per week. And they're going to come in on hours that are going to be specially designed by this board in our community that uh, does not impact our gateway and uh, other businesses and schools and churches that are in a direct area. We've also learned that uh, rather than beating a dead horse over the combustibles and flammables, if they're allowed, they're allowed. We're not going to do any contingencies uh, uh, based on that. Um, with addition to uh, the, the fire suppression, we've already learned that we're not going to uh, ask about the curbs. We're going to pursue with the tanks. The tanks is, the, is and are the way to go. Um, especially for safety. We do need uh, a complete design, of, if, if this is approved, we would need a complete design uh, between your team, our engineer, and I would also like uh, our safety professionals, Dave and Robert, to be a part of that, to look at how that's going to be designed and where everything is going to go. And um, as far as the civil side, there's not really much going on there from, uh, from what we heard tonight. But that tank is a very, very uh, important part to this puzzle. The one thing I would ask this board uh, to take a look at is something that I'm going to ask you to ask your client. Being that this is of a sensitive nature, or matter to us. It's our first time out of the box. We understand that you're going to follow all the rules and regulation. Would your client be opposed to having our fire official on a quarterly basis come and review your facility with a complete check and balance sheet from everything that we've learned tonight, let's say for the next 24 months, so we could have a comfort level in our community uh, that would give us a real good understanding of what you're doing and how you're conducting your, not how you're conducting business financially, but how we're going to live together, especially with Emirates right alongside. That is my big concern and what's happening with the fumes and how things are being run. And That's aside, acceptable to my client. And if you want to include the, the police department in that quarterly? Yes. So that yes. they're kept up to speed, more than happy to have them along yes. also. I, I would like to do that. And this is above and beyond their, their normal checks. Just every, every quarter, they go out, they have a report, they send it back, and we take a look at that. Does this board have any problem with that? Yes. Chair may wish to include uh, fire department and EMS. Yeah. Well, all, all the all the all first responders. All the responders. Whoever you want. Yep. Doors open. Okay. So, does anybody have anything else to add? Okay. Does anyone? Would anyone like to make a motion? Do you want to hear some of the? Do you want to recap yeah. the? Oh, what, what I just did. Go ahead. These, these are what I had. Um, that I that I think should be conditions. Uh, you you want to have the the hours of operation there, which you talked about, seven a.m. to five p.m. on weekdays. Uh, the applicant indicated that um, any drums will be stored indoors in a designated rack area. I think that's important to mm -hmm. put in as a condition if the board approves it. Um, no manufacturing at this facility. No no blending. It's right. warehousing. Uh, no retail. Um, so it's technical. No, no backup generators on the roof, but I don't think that needs to be a condition. That'll be on the plans. Abide by the noise codes. That's a given. So can I just ask a question? Is sure. that a condition, or is that part of the resolution? That's going to be. That's it's going to be discussed. In, yes, so it'll be in the resolution, but I don't know if we need to make it a specific condition. It's not that's a condition. That's totally what totally on the plan. That's what it's going to be. Uh, delivery people are going to be advised of times and routes of deliveries to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. and no idling of the trucks. Need to, we need to define them, Mr. Ray. Define the routes and the route times. Going in that will have to be, yeah, we're going to need to flush that out a little bit. And then what just came up was um, 
the applicant will meet with the with the uh, with first responders prior to opening, just to walk them through what they might expect in the event there's a problem, and then quarterly exhibit uh, exhibits quarterly um, inspections by our police fire, the first responders for the first 24 months. Just until we get just 24 months to see yeah, how it yeah. goes, and they, they may also invite that for right. the forever. However, we'll also put in there that it will not impact your flow of business. Okay, okay, that's fine. And the big thing is the tank, and we mm -hmm. we talked about that a lot in terms of monitoring wells, groundwater, pump outs, backflow. The entire design build right. process has to be done with your code officials present and observing and doing it. That's going to have to be designed so standard. Um, my question to the board is, do, do you want to just, in the event this is approved, make that a condition, and I will certainly put the language in there, and it would have to be brought to Victor, Kevin, our consultants, our fire people, to review to their satisfaction, or do you want to, do you want to see that again at all? I think it's now in the professional's hands. Okay. We did with our diligence at this point. Agree. Uh, I don't think we need to go and override with the I, I agree. I agree with that. Now I have one before you end. I have one question, Mr. McNamara. Um, a little out of order. However, um, the police chief would like to either ask a question and make a statement, but it's already closed to the public, so I don't. I'll wave it. He can get back up. Okay. Just, uh, I just wanted to clarify the hours you had asked about. So school, our school is the latest at 8.35. That's the, that's the time our bell rings. So anytime between 9 a, 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., which is when St. Teresa's gets out, okay. is pretty much wide open for that for that specific delivery time that we're looking for that's not interfering with the schools. I just have a question. I mean, do we have restrictions on Flexivan, that Fox trucking, what time they are allowed to do? We do. We do? Mm-hmm. Okay. Would yep. we be better off putting a restriction on times instead of just saying these are the three hours? Because if somebody comes at six o'clock in the morning, they're going to go to your facility and not idle. Well, they're not open until well, seven. But so. that doesn't mean the truck's not going to come. I don't know where the trucks are coming from. Well, it sounds like you want them to be there between nine a.m. and two p.m. according to the chief. Yeah. We yeah. can live with that. Well, what Mr. Scuderi is saying is we also don't want them arriving early waiting for you. Though. No, we'll tell them. Because then they can't get in. The we'll tell them don't arrive before 9 o'clock because we've been told by the borough you're not welcome. Don't right. take, don't take it personally, nine, but, you know. Nothing before 9 or after 2. Right. And then you'll have to discuss. Um, I can't regulate FedEx or UPS no, 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 for our understand. delivery trucks. I don't think we're talking about those right. kind of trucks. We're you're talking, talking about, about the, one or the right. Yeah, the two a week that we anticipate. You know, the natural cluster of business, the vans and stuff like that. Okay. And if your access is from 22 and not the boulevard. Correct. Well, yeah. That would be the limiter going to the east. Okay. All right. Um, South. And Anything else? to specify yeah. however you want us to tell them to go, and we'll include it in the contract and dictate to them that this is the entry route, this is the exit route, and these are your times. Kevin, any language that you would suggest from a planning perspective as to the route that we can put in a condition? That, or I, th I think yeah, I can work all right on that. Okay. Okay. Condition's Kevin, fine by Kevin me. Kevin and I will, will work on that. Yeah. And uh, this is a use variance, so um, when there's a motion made, those are the conditions I have. The key one, well, they're all key, but the key one is with regard to the tanks, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, turn that over to our to our consultants and our professional people. Um, and uh, again, Kathy, uh, seven members are called, and you know, we, we talked about the seven members, and five affirmative votes are needed. This will be use variance, preliminary, and final site plan approval. Five affirmative votes are needed, and those are the, con in addition to our normal conditions as far as paying taxes and getting any other approvals you need right. from any other agencies. And that's pretty much it. There are also some waivers requested, Mr. Reed. Yes. Um, they were on the application checklist. Dealt with that on, checklist. We probably should have dealt with that initially. Uh, do you want to comment on those, Kevin? Or? Uh, no. Um, I've looked. Uh, Mr. Vinagre, did you have any comment on the waivers requested? There were <laughs> items 11, 13, 14, 20, 29, and 30 of the checklist. Uh, your staff had no objection. Obviously, we've had a hearing, so. <laughs> but, okay. Are we good? We're good. Mr. McNamara, you, did you have something? No, no, I'm good. Mr. McNamara, you're... I'm good with everything that's been recited by council. Okay. 
Would someone like to make a motion Based to? Based upon the testimony, the conditions, the recommendations of our professionals, I'd like to make a motion to approve this application. A second. Okay, the motion was made by Mr. Grimaldi, seconded by uh, Mr. Pantina. Roll call, please. Mr. Caserna? Yes. Mr. Grimaldi? Yes. Mr. Pantina? Yes. Mr. Mazio? Yes. Mr. Ladowdy? Yes. Mr. Clella? Yes. Mr. Scuderi? Yes. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Welcome Thank to you very much. Welcome, guys. Well, thank you. Mr. McNamara, again, great job. Thank you very yeah. much, sir. Much we appreciate it. Enjoy great. the holiday, everyone. Hey, you 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 Guys, we're still in session, okay, but we can make this kind of quick. Kathy? A lot. Okay. Any other business? Guys, we're still in session. Mr. Farrell. Mr. Farrell, five minutes. Let them know we're still in session. We're still in session, please. The board is still in session, please. Thank you. New business? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, any comments for the good of the board? Seeing none. Uh, at this point, we need a motion to make the motion to close. No, no, no open, open, to the the open to the public. I thought you did that already. Right. Okay. I'll make a motion to open to the public. Motion made by Mr. Gormali. Second. By Mr. Ladati. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone from the public wishing to speak? Seeing none. Make a motion to close the public. Closed by Second. Mr. Pantina. Second by Mr. Gormali. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. A motion to adjourn. What's our name? Aye. December. First. May. May. Oh, second. 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 Second